It's the start of an incredible journey, a new era for motorsport. Welcome to Extreme E, an all-electric racing series with a purpose, to raise awareness of climate change. And we start here in the remote deserts of Saudi Arabia, around the canyons of Al Yula, the Extreme E teams, nine men and nine women, will do battle across a car-breaking landscape of rocks and sand. The 8.8 kilometer course is breathtakingly beautiful, but it will test every car to its limit. Hello and welcome to Saudi Arabia. The amazing landscape you're looking at may look like it's from another planet, but Al Yula is a desert location about 250 kilometers from the Red Sea and a rather sticky 10 hour drive from Saudi capital Riyadh. It's a wild and unforgiving place for our first ex pre with a car breaking course touring through canyons and deep sand and over sharp rocks. Before we get going, let's get you up to its speed with Extreme E Basics. Earth, a planet in perfect balance, providing life across seven continents, from the biodiverse rainforest to the deepest parts of our oceans. But this existence is a threat. Humans are pumping dangerous levels of carbon into the atmosphere, causing the planet's temperature to rise. In the last decade, we have been witness to the hottest temperatures ever recorded, and huge parts of our ice caps are melting into the ocean, disrupting the ecosystem, threatening our way of life. The consequences of climate change are affecting millions of people across the planet. Cities worldwide, everywhere, are going to become uninhabitable. Our planet is heading towards a climate disaster that threatens all life on Earth as we know it. We have to act now to make those changes. Extreme will bring together the fastest drivers on four wheels in fully electric racing off-road SUVs to some of the most remote and damaged areas on Earth raising awareness of the environment, electrification and equality. I have an impossible dream to race electric cars in the most remote corners of the planet. I know, without leaving a trace. The x will be held across five countries, each highlighting the local impact of climate change. From the polluted ocean of Senegal, melting ice caps of Greenland, diminishing rainforests of the Amazon, retreating glaciers of Patagonia, to rapidly heating deserts of Saudi Arabia, using the power of sport to highlight the effects human impact is having on our world. I think it's really important to really immerse yourself in those areas and see what's happening with climate change so we can really increase awareness and from awareness we can have more people taking more actions. To tackle these demanding locations requires one of the most robust racing cars ever built, the Odyssey 21. This purpose-designed all-electric machine is constructed using cutting-edge environmental technologies and materials. The battery will be charged using a hydrogen fuel cell, producing clean, emission-free energy. Behind the wheel of these off-road machines will be some of the biggest names in racing. The car it feels insane. It's amazing how much torque you have to have immediate power when you touch the throttle pedal. The drivers, they didn't know what to expect and they were blown away. That's probably the biggest shock is just how much torque you're able to get. And marking an historic first for international motorsport, the driver lineup will be equally split 50% male, 50% female. The level of competition is going to be insane. Teams will go wheel to wheel on the most extreme terrains in the most extreme temperatures, driving the most extreme vehicles. Extreme E takes racing to uncharted territories by bringing the action to some of the most remote locations, all of which are suffering from the destruction of our environment. But there is more to this than flat-out racing. A team of industry-leading scientists have joined our race for a greener future to provide unrivaled insights into the regions where we compete, guaranteeing we race without a trace. When the chequered flag falls, our legacy programs will ensure that Extreme E leaves a lasting difference in each and every location. We want to bring awareness, we want to showcase electric cars, and we want to leave behind a legacy linked to climate change and to pollution. Wouldn't it be great to be a part of something that really does make a difference? 
This is fierce and exciting racing with the future of our planet at its heart. This is the greatest adventure of our time. This is Extreme E. Well, you've already heard a bit about how tough this 8.8 kilometer course is going to be. It is a massive test for the extraordinary electric SUVs. We've got huge rocks, deep sand, treacherous climbs and drops, and a few things that have tripped some of the drivers up already. Yeah, so let's take a closer look at what our nine teams are facing and what they'll have to do, more importantly, to navigate this fantastic course in Saudi Arabia. Let's have a look. Round one of the Extreme E Championship will be held on this 8.8 kilometer circuit, situated in the heart of the Saudi Arabian desert in the country's very first world UNESCO site. A course built around this incredible dramatic landscape to highlight the effects of desertification on this delicate ecosystem. The course is made up of gates that the drivers must pass through, but with no track limits, the teams can choose their own line around the course at the best lap time. So away from the starting area, it's a very long run up to what is effectively turn one. Now that won't matter when you're running on your own in the time trials. In the race section of the event, you're going to want to get there first because of the dust. There are many sandy, bumpy sections to the track, undulations, and it's about how hard you can attack them. How much can the Odyssey 21 take? How quickly can you pass over the very difficult terrain? Slowest part of the course, up at the far end, through a dry riverbed, and then around a hairpin left, which takes you around the back side of the course, and to the most dramatic feature of all. More than 45 degrees, a 100 meter drop, straight down a sand dune into a narrow gate at the bottom. Side by side there, things are going to get very tricky indeed. Undulations again, changing between road surfaces, sand, gravel, rocks. There's some undergrowth out there too. The drivers are going to have to pick their line, but they're going to be able to choose their line. Separate paths, which one's quicker? Does it give you an opportunity to take some time off a competitor or maybe be able to make a pass? Another downhill section here, coming towards the end of the lap, and it's another transition from sand onto gravel. This might suit the rally drivers just a little bit more. Passing onto a road, which effectively is the last track. But by now, I think you know whether you're going to take the check flag first or not. There is the finish, and that is a lap of Alula. Well, if you missed the action earlier on today, you really did miss some action, I'm afraid. This was the first ever car out on track. It was Sebastian Loeb for Lewis Hamilton's X44 team and his teammate Cristina Gutierrez. Great driver change from them. Benchmark set by them as well would take quite a while in the session to be matched. Really good drive by both drivers, no major issues. Next up, it was Jensen Button's team, and you can see a little bit more rugged, but again, the driver changeover for Jensen Button uh, and Michaela Arlen Kotlinski taking the wheel. Yeah, the problem for them, they stopped out on course, unfortunately. This was Timmy Hansen. Rally cross background, of course, look at that nicely over that section. Swapped over to Katie Mullings. It was Katie who got the drama. The rear right deflated on her halfway around the course. And look at this, full concentration mode, full send, flick in the Saudi sand up into the air. Timmy watching as Katie hung on to the finish line. But it really was a great drive by the young Brit. And uh, she got it to the flag. Unfortunately, this guy didn't. Yeah, Stefan Sarazan, Veloce, managed to roll the car, just coming down off the big hill, bumped in, and you can see he got a whole load of sand in his face for the present. Jamie Chadwick looking on. She wasn't able to get in the car. Carlos Sainz, three times winner of the Dakar Rally. He took it steady yesterday in shakedown. He did not take it steady today. That was the best road jump we saw through the entire session. He nearly cleared the whole thing. We're hoping someone will in the next one. Laya Sainz taking over from him, doing a fantastic job. But finally, there was a challenger to Sebastian Loeb's top time with Gutierrez. Yeah, Rosberg's team really showing what they could do. Christopherson handing over to Molly Taylor. This team really threatening. You can just see the front end action. We're expecting plenty more of that over the next couple of hours as we bring Bring you 90 minutes of the best qualifying action we can. Huge, huge send there from Molly Taylor, absolutely loving her star. Now, Ekstrom came in, handed over to uh, his teammate Claudia Hurtgen, and unfortunately, later on in the lap, this happened. Absolutely huge monster off for Claudia Hurtgen. 
side over, end over end, but you began to hear she was perfectly okay back in the paddock, safe and sound around 10, 15 minutes later. So great job by Spark on the car builds. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. These cars really having to, I suppose, work for their um, work for their survival. So this was Christine Jampiola and uh, Oliver Bennett or Christine G. Z and uh, they gave it a good go. They got a penalty though, which really hindered their progress. Interesting looking at the changeover. They're rushing Bennett out because it hadn't been quite so quick, and then of course uh, broke the speed limit, and it was a 75 second penalty. For though, unfortunately, Chip Ganassi Racing, the dramas continued. Kyle LaDuke with broken power steering reset the car for Sarah Price. The power steering was working at first, but Sarah had to hustle it, Jenny. Look at the amount of power she's having to put into just to hold on to it. Yeah, she did such a good job. Such a good job. So well done to them. That was your qualifying one. Let's do it all over again and bring you qualifying two now. Wow. So Q1 was uh, was exciting. It really was exciting this morning. Sam Bird is alongside myself, Andrew Coley, and Jenny Gow in the commentary box. Sam, um, it had just about it all, didn't it, really? Well, we've been in here for many hours now, Simon. Uh, you know, <laughs> the day started early for us, but first quality flew by, didn't it? It was super exciting. It had everything. It had some great skill, it had drama, it had barrel rolls, it had punctures. It had the lot. Yeah, it did. It certainly did. We we had some, we had some serious. I, th I think we had more. I mean, Alejandro Gag would have been hoping for an exciting first session. I, you know, I think that would have exceeded everybody's expectations by uh, by a mile. Unfortunately, not in a great way for two of the teams. So we're not sure yet on whether or not we're going to see the cars from Veloce uh, and also uh, from uh, who's the other team that had the role? Of course, Ekstrom with Cupra and Hertgen and Cupra Apps. So just we're hearing that probably they're not going to make it to the line. Just Jenny. seen a lovely image because in this championship, you are restricted to how many people can actually get hands on the car. Matthias Ekstrom was there trying to help rebuild that App Cupra car. So everybody, hands on deck. This is the command center. It's telling okay, us qualifying is ready. Three and three minutes, that was the voice of Scott Elkin, our race director. He'll be up in the control tower telling us what's going on. And a, a familiar name for you, Sam, because he also does the Formula E races. So you've sat in a room with him many a time. One of the best, um, if not the best, race directors that I've ever worked with, really professional, and he will listen to the drivers and take their views on board, especially with a growing championship like this. It's important to have someone like that. So let's take a look around the course again. I know you've had a, a little brief look already. That down at gate two where it says gravel, that's like a dry riverbed. I suspect it was a long time since there was a river here. It's narrow, there's a dip in the road, and we're finding that's cutting up a little bit. Gate three, up towards the top of the hill, you've got the big drop. At the bottom of that big drop is where we saw the huge roll for Stefan Sarazan as he crossed the road, which is just down in the valley before gate four. Gate four, probably where Arlen Kotlinski had the problem and, and the car came to a, a halt just just briefly. The sandy section in the back here is where Loeb went off the road. Jenny, this, most of this course has caused an issue for somebody at some point. It's tough. It is a really tough course. 8.8 .8 kilometers, but actually there are perils and dangers every, everywhere you go. It looks like desert, it looks like sand, but actually there's so much more depth to it because you've got this varying kind of stability underneath the car. It's such a three-dimensional course as well. Sam, you know, you, you've been around some wonderful racetracks. I know places like Spa, Brands Hatch, you know, uh, Laguna Seca. In the world of, of motor racing, we have some wonderful roller coaster tracks, but it's still not quite like this. No, this this certainly is uh, something that I've not experienced before. One but One I'm minute. enjoying watching the, the the course evolve. So we would rubber a circuit in, and it would get quicker and quicker. What they're doing here is they're laying troughs basically in the sand and it's making it trickier sebastian Loeb was first out this morning he had the cleanest track let's say he's now going to experience he's going to go out second obviously because his female compatriot will go out before him he will experience now a pitted troughed circuit for the first time it's going to be very different isn't it for for the car and they switched up switch round now so before mostly it was the male driver that went first and in the second it was the female driver now they switch roles and it'll be the female driver whose turn it is to go first and then in this case sebastian loeb will have to go out and stay in that switch zone to take control on the start line sebastian loeb's teammate interesting now because as sam was saying 
the course has developed quite a lot. Now, first time out, you would have found that Gutierrez would have been guided a little bit by Sebastian Lowe, potentially on the conditions, but the conditions where eight cars have passed over it twice since have changed quite a lot. So now it's Gutierrez's turn to pass that information back to Sebastian when he jumps in the car. In terms of overall time, you can't really compare. She's away from the line now. We can't compare first lap to second lap because the run from the switch zone into lap two is completely different from the run from the start into lap one. So if you're looking at the lap times, you can't really compare them. It's about times within the session. Who can go quicker against as a pairing against the other cars? Gutierrez, Spanish, 29-year-old, and she knows sand. She's a Dakar rally specialist, I suppose. Some could say finished five Dakar rallies. She's extremely successful at this, brings a real knowledge base to this championship and her as well as Loeb really really good team yeah absolutely and it's great you know what? it's great to see these girls hustling the Odyssey car around this course it really is I've got to say I'm thoroughly enjoying the spectacle I mean uh, Christina has a wealth of experience in comparison to to some of the other girls out there but proper off-road drivers. Proper that all, off -road her, driver. all her experience is this kind of... It, yeah. It, it, and it's important, and, isn't it? And it will take time for some of the other girls to adjust to this skill set. And some of the other guys. And some of the other guys, yeah. absolutely. Like, I mean, if you, so if you went to do this, Sam, like, let's give it a bit of perspective. You know, you're a guy, you're at the top of your game in Formula E. Really honestly, if you went here, where would you expect to be? And like, you'd be as I honest would as want... you want. I mean, obviously, you no, can no. say I would win because I'm Sam Burke. <laughs> 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 I, would want, I would want to be at the sharp end, but I, in all honesty, I'd be totally out of my comfort zone. This is not something that I've experienced before. It's a different skill set, different way of thinking as we go up into the ravine section here. How does she do? Last time, it was a little bit scrappy. She's got it better this time, actually. Very nicely done by Gutierrez. Just a little hop down. See how she approaches the section where Sarazan got it so badly wrong this morning. Get a few, a few rocks getting exposed here and there, and it is going to be important picking your line through these sections to make sure that you don't do anything to damage your car, your tyres in particular, obviously. It's, it's a big part of this sport is is making is judging how much of a beating you can give it. I mean, we've seen a couple of people have given these cars a serious beating in, in all the wrong ways in, in the first session. Now the bubbles it, are being beaten out. Yeah, it's not indestructible is what we're saying. So although, you know, they, we want to see them attack it as much as they can, Sam, but in the same way you have to look after your car on a circuit, they've still got to judge what the car can take out on, uh, out on our, our, our course. We're still learning here in the commentary box, but the guys there at the track, the men and women, they're still learning about the Odyssey car what it can achieve yeah what it how it handles what 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 you can put it through yeah. during the course she gets a massive oversteer <laughs> there <laughs> okay the thing the thing is having seen that first session when we saw her and jenny get really badly penalized for just a little bit sideways it kind of makes you hold your breath when people are making small mistakes and you're going to get away with some and not others this is that little dip where they have to cross carefully they're all straight lining that now between the two gates yeah there seems to be more of a pattern doesn't they're developing although she's taken quite an inside line i was looking to see if that was potentially we still haven't quite figured out everywhere carl the dude crashed yesterday he said he took the split line he went to the left of a rock outcrop and i wondered if that was it stuck it in behind. Do you remember, Sam, we watched the onboard this morning, we haven't managed to figure out where no, it was. Oh, they looked like oh. there might have been a small shortcut there, again sideways over the road. Good Almost girl. Carla Sainz style, yeah. That was really nice, actually, oh, she recovered, hustling. didn't she? Sideways again, and this time she has to correct the car and bring it back onto what, you know, the main part of the of the course. You could see it just stepped out towards those uh, sections of grass, and you know, Sarazan would have got away with that moment if the car hadn't speared off to the right and clipped one of those sections of grass. Yeah, the rear end of this now seems a lot looser than it was earlier on today. I don't know if the, the conditions have changed so much that the rear end would be that's sliding the, around. That's the surface, Jenny, changing so much. This is this kind of groove section that we that that Andrew was in, you know telling me about pretty much. You can see clearly now on the visual when you see on board, you can see where the cars have been driving. And if you're not within those grooves, if you go out of one groove and into another, the car is all over the place. And the tyres are crossing those those ruts sideways. You know, this is the section I think where Claudia Hurt can have her off coming down the hill. 
plenty of steering inputs for Gutierrez. I'm wondering if they've changed. The other thing, Sam, is you know, they're still learning in terms of settings. Potentially, they've gone back and gone, let's try this in the next session, especially as they're in P2. So they've got the luxury of, of they want not having the best run ever, Jenny. You know, you're right up there. Let's try something, see if it takes the car a lot in the right direction or a lot in the wrong direction. And you go, do you know what? It didn't work. That's fine because we're in P2. You maybe wouldn't risk it if you were in P6 or 7 right on the cusp of not making it through. It's a gamble, though. There are big points on offer for this round. By the end of today, we'll have our first championship points award, and it's 12 points yeah. for the person that manages to put it in P1. Look at the angle that she's bringing looks, that home in. I agree. It looks loose at the rear. I do agree. So on the brakes, down towards the switch zone. Now, having seen the penalty that was given out earlier on to Hispano Suiza, 75 seconds. And I think that means they were only speeding... I've got terrible maths. Speeding by... It was five seconds per kilometre. I'm just going to get the calculator out. 75 divided by five equals... So, yeah, 15 kilometres an hour over the speed limit led to a 75-second penalty. Out of the car. And in goes Sebastian Loeb. Now, this time we're going to see belts needing to be lengthened. She didn't do the clever switch that we saw earlier, so a different approach to this. They're doing the belts for Sebastian, aren't they? See her seat insert on the floor. Yeah, just chucked away, isn't it, Sam? That's what you do? Yep. <laughs> I don't need a seat insert. I'm, you know, tall. Uh, yeah, of course you are. <laughs> Luckily, they're picking up as they go because that is the legacy project as well. They went to the beach the other day, down to the Red Sea. They helped with the turtle project and they cleaned a whole load of plastic off the beach. And that's one of the things about Extreme. E. It is about legacy as well. Loeb watching across to his team who will have been timing at the side of the road. He's got the, the limiter on and he'll cross. Look at the two white boards down at the bottom of your screen there. That effectively is the point at which he can light it up. So he's going to cruise down towards that. To everybody so Loeb watching is about home, to that start is like his run, but we're about to head down uh, and have a cat, uh, catch up with Gutierrez. Christina, it looked like a nice smooth run there. How is it for you? Yeah, the second lap was very difficult to chance because it's very broken. The car now is less power, so totally different than the first lap. So I think we managed a lot with the car and I feel a little bit less confident than the first lap, but it's okay, I'm here and that's so important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you can see the car sliding underneath Sebastian Loeb and he is struggling with this car as well. So I don't know what they've changed in the setup, if anything, but it doesn't seem quite as smooth a ride as they had in the first setup. And Sam, we were just talking about that switch zone before we heard from Cristina Gutierrez. Sorry, everybody. Um, I just wanted to make the point, those white boards are effectively like the end of the pit lane. So as a normal circuit, you would know press the pit speed button end of pit lane and you go out on the track flat out for me guys I think the car looks okay but I think that um, due to reasons maybe that we don't know about as um, uh, as Christina just said Christina just said on the uh, on the interview that they're running at slightly less power now so I think they're losing a little bit of time in a straight line and maybe they're trying to make up for time in the corners, but which is why you might see the rear of the car being thrown around a bit more. Interesting. And if they are, then also potentially the car isn't pulling itself straight quite so much as it was before when you're jumping on the gas. Loeb, though, airing it out as the run down the hill. 145, 100, close to 150 kilometers an hour down the hill there. Going to keep it smooth through here. It's funny, isn't it? You, you start to earmark the places where you think, ooh, <laughs> thanks to earlier thanks to earlier on today two victims in the first qualifying session really hoping those teams can get the car repaired for tomorrow come out and take part in the shootout which will be for uh, p7 8 and 9 but uh, yeah according to our timing screens we won't be seeing them in this session disappointed for veloce and for app cupra two big teams out of the running for today as we said hopefully they will be back by tomorrow to take part in the races and don't forget you're watching qualifying, it's a one-car shootout tomorrow. Three cars on track, all at the same time. And they call it the crazy race for a reason, I think. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, we, we, yeah certainly one car will go through. I mean, with, with three cars, I just can't, three cars, I can't quite contemplate how we're going to keep up, to be honest, with everything <laughs> that's happened. I think uh, we can just sit back and let everybody at home well, watch yeah, and enjoy it. Yeah, we might as well. Yeah, there's, it's, uh, 
you know, I might be tempted to rename the crazy race the carnage race, to be honest, because uh, we've had some of that today as well. So I think we're all looking forward to uh, all looking forward to seeing three cars on side. Format completely different on day one and day two, and I think that's exciting too. Absolutely. So this is Lewis Hamilton's car. He picked out the drivers. He picked the team to run the car as well, the X44 and that dazzling kind of purpley blue color just weaving in through the desert a di very different line for Sebastian Loeb there going right over the bank of the of the road yeah notice that he turned in a lot earlier than what everybody else has done everybody else has been using the opening and I think he's seen that everybody's been getting a little bit of air there where the tracks are starting to develop he's taken a different line different approach I don't know whether it's worked or not. It certainly looks smooth. This will be interesting because this, in the first run of qualifying, this is where Sebastian Loeb made a small mistake. Now, you don't say that very often, but he went wide and ran into the deep sand and just really struggled to get the car back on track. It looks like he's done a, a cleaner version this time. Yeah, he got a bad bounce, didn't he? It pushed him off the edge of the dune. And once you drop off the edge of the dune, Jenny, gravity takes over, and, and, and with the sand, you can drop a long way down very quickly. <laughs> so many nerves in that command centre. So many people watching this car bounce around especially after this morning because they're looking at it and going look we, we don't want that to be us we want to make sure you get through this clean now you're taking a big haul of championship points remember there are only five rounds I think it's 12 points available today 25 available tomorrow for the win so there is a big haul of points available you know you compare yourself to some of those teams that you thought might be a threat that maybe aren't going to make it and you could take a big old championship lead here if you're in the top six and they are not and everybody said the likes of a uh, sarazan and jamie chadwick who were in the veloce team they would be a real threat for this championship well they may well not score many points at all so from the this same weekend. with extra absolutely right you've got to make the best of your time when you can grab those big points and th these guys are in such a strong position that's the Three thing that they, they were looking at how far ahead they were in the last one low cross line 1107 so um, they were running P2, so it was Rosberg racing with Christofferson and Taylor were P1, Loeb uh, and Gutierrez for X44 were P2, Tell and between them was only 4.5 seconds, then the Actiona team, really what was the gap there? back for them, was, a, was almost a further 30 seconds, Jenny, so they really so. could afford to just wind it in a little bit and get a safe finish, they know they'll be top two in the standings. If the power output was slightly less, that was a really mighty attempt from Gutierrez and Lowe because their, their previous run was only 20, 25 seconds quicker. Yeah, so I think a that's a really, really strong first run from, from the X44 team. We're going to head down and see if we're going to have a catch up with uh, the man himself as he finishes his run, Sebastian Loeb. Sebastian, you've just com completed your qualifiers. Where's your confidence right now? Yeah, it was okay. Uh, we tried to secure a bit. It's very rough out there now, and we saw a few mistakes in the morning, so I didn't want to do a mistake. We had a good position uh, in the first qualify. Just wanted to secure the, sa the safe uh, position. It's what we did. I think we did a clean run. Not big risk, but uh, we are the finish. That's the most important at the moment. And as a team, how happy are you? Sorry? And as a team, looking at you guys as a whole, how yeah. happy are you? Uh, when I speak about what I, I just said, it's about the team. Christina did a, a great job in the morning, in the afternoon too. So uh, she's really fast. She's, she has a good driving style, not taking big risk, but still fast. So I think we are, at the moment, it's more than we expected. We are on the line, so we have to continue like this. Thank you so much. Thank you. So a uh, return this afternoon, first car out on track again for X44, and it's Cristina Gutierrez and Sebastian Loeb, but this time Gutierrez going first, Jenny. Yeah, and really charging across the sandy landscape and down this huge drop that we have, getting air and really gliding down there to try and take as much pace as she can into the bumpy section ahead of her. Yeah, it was a good run. Interesting, uh, Sebastian Loeb and her, I spoke to them the other day when they were in quarantine. That was the big sideways moment for her. And she was saying that it was a dream come true for her to be working with both Loeb and Lewis Hamilton, their heroes of hers, and, and that Sebastian was a good teacher. Sebastian was shaking his head and, and, and laughing as if to say, I'm better. not. But, uh, you know, you can't have many better teachers than a nine-time World Rally champion. No, they'll both be learning from each other. This is a real coming together of great minds. Brilliant stuff. 
Next up, we have Jensen Button's team, and this is going to be really fascinating because last time out didn't have the greatest away. They had a problem with the car, had to park it for about 30 seconds while Michaela was in the car. So they need to claw back time. We're going to look to see what they can do. This is going to be an important run if they're going to try and win their way back up the order. So lights flashing on Button's car just tells you that... Uh Sorry, just seeing at the bottom of the, the corner there, the sort of the positions Gutierrez and Lowe, of course, in P1 because uh, nobody else has been out yet. That's uh, JBXE's team in the command centre. And yeah, lights flashing on the car, basically saying that the power's on and it's ready to go, but that it's in neutral. And that's what they're using at the side of the road to time the switch zone as well. The car has to remain in neutral for 45 seconds. That's why you see the drivers looking across. Now the lights are on solid on the front, and that tells you that they are good to go. Off the line and away, loads of wheels spin for Michaela Arling Kodlinski. We know some of the teams will be trying to dial in those starts. They've got 10 different positions that they can program whatever maps they want onto to try and get away from the line. Sam, maybe you can explain to people a little bit more. Obviously, you know, a map on an electric motor is similar to a map on a, on a conventional engine and it affects how it goes, I guess, off the line. In, yes, basically. But um, I'm not sure what they're running with regards to TC. Um, TC? I, no TC. No TC. Top cap. No, no TC. TC. So they, they've wow. got a limiter. They've got a limiter on the front wheels because the car sits down at the rear and the front wheels can spin up more. They can actually set a limit on that to say, okay, front wheels must never exceed the speed of the rear wheels. Getting very geeky there. But off the line, you know, it, so much talk from an electric motor so early. How is it in Formula E getting away from the line? Is there a danger of spinning up, or do you we guys have, have some, TC? We have some very good software. Traction control, or is that not allowed? Absolutely not allowed, but there's <laughs> there's some great software with every team. Nice to hear. There we go. Michaela Arling Kotlinski out on course, doing very well. Nice run so far, heading up towards the climb now uh, and then the big drop. Narrow section there. That, of course, that's the turn up at the far end. That's the first time we've seen it from the drone. Looks completely different. It is narrow down there. Definitely not going to be any passing down at that gate. It's nice to see climbing. that angle, actually, yeah, is, to, yeah. to get a real sort of bird's eye feel of it. There's some great camera angles with this new championship that I've just not seen before. And it's fabulous to get a real feeling of what it's like in the car and to fly over it so you can see it from every dimension. So this is the drop off. Narrows down right next to the cliff. You've got to get it in between the gates, turn right, and then you can't see anything. Blind summit and down you go. Hidden hope and back on the throttle. You've got to send it. You know, once you've done one lap, you know what's there, don't you? It's, you know, if, if the rally guys had their co-drivers with him, yeah, it's flat over crest. You just go for it. it once you've done one lap, Sam, that's it. Send it. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, look, <laughs> J Jensen, <laughs> Jensen is Jensen's one of the best drivers in the world. No questions asked uh, for me, anyway. He's still learning this whole and concept of rally driving. Right now, they're in. They 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 left round one of qualifying in fifth place and they're kind of in fifth place on their own at the moment there's nothing really that they can go forwards with um and Michaela's learning Mikhail too you know Michaela's learning absolutely all the time as well as we see Jensen there in the pits with his orange visor on for visibility reasons um, this is a learning process for them could just hear Jensen there, can you a little bit of chat? He's down there pretty early. I wonder if he might have stayed in the, we've seen some of the drivers stay in the command centre a bit longer, because obviously in the command centre they've got the same pictures that you guys have got at home so they can properly keep an eye on uh, on the what's going on with their teammate. We mentioned earlier that the teams were filming the runs and they were doing what we said they were doing. They were filming the runs so they've immediately got that to take back and look at with the drivers. Um, otherwise, they've got to find it on the planner like you guys have at home. This is such a different skill set for so many of the drivers coming into Extreme E because Jensen Button is used to getting in the car and there's a circuit and he knows exactly the way he's meant to go. He knows exactly the line he's meant to take. He's got years of experience of doing that. This, he's got to ask his team for directions. Where do I go? You know, it's a huge expanse of desert and you can quite easily find yourself going the wrong way. Le left at the second canyon, Jensen, and uh, we're all good. Matthias Ekstrom said that he'd lost his way a couple of times on day one uh, just a little nod to the livery on the jbxe car i love just that little nod to the to the braun grand prix car from 2009 i just think it's amazing i think he's run a similar similar livery didn't he on the trophy truck i think over in america also on the gt cars jenny so yeah i like it i got to drive that car did you i got to drive the braun car once really yeah goodwood at the goodwood festival oh. of speed what yeah. was it like 
It was that oh, was awesome, nostalgic. It was, um, yeah. you know, Jensen Button genuinely won the title in a car that was the same as that. I think he owned the particular car, so I think I was driving a Rubens car, but that the brawn car yeah it was yeah uh, that's amazing very, but very it's cool, cool isn't it i love the fact i love that the this, colors yeah I exactly really, it's really like a nod colors. back to what is a, a wonderful career i think the, a win in any fa world championship is amazing obviously so many people see um, f1 as the pinnacle and rightly so you know i think it's the longest established um motorsport from that way but this sport is bringing together world champions from Absolutely. the different disciplines sam and i think some of the fans at home are going to be quite surprised yes i got a tweet yesterday somebody said oh do you think jensen's going to be on I was like, no, and even Jensen doesn't think he's going to be unstoppable. You know, the other guys, maybe there's someone like Loeb, you might say the same, but Jensen knows, and I love the fact he's come here and exposed himself as an F1 world champion to, to something he's got to learn, but he's enjoying it. It takes guts to do that, to step away from your arena, but that's what all of these, yeah. well, a lot of them are doing because no one has the exact skill set for this. So you can see Michaela Arlen Kalinsky coming into the switch zone. She'll have to apply the brakes as soon as she goes past the board. Just rest it in. Oh, fuck. Oh, oh, I think you heard Jensen's thoughts there on the entry to the switch zone. Do you not uh, think he liked it so much? Apologies. And uh, yeah, so Michaela Arlen Kodlinski, looking at the time, I reckon she was about five seconds, maybe a little bit more off the pace uh, of Gutierrez. I think that before. she forgot to engage the pit limiter. So you think there might be a penalty as well? I'm not sure, but if I looked at the speed then, she decreased the speed and then increased it again. Let's see what the, the what the stewards have to say, but that's my that's my first initial thought. Certainly what Jensen called, he called it straight away and said she's going too fast. So I think she applied brakes, then accelerated, didn't put on the pit limiter, as you said, so there might well be a fine for that. Let's have a listen. Not a lot being said between the two is there right now. I think... Um, Unfortunately, having seen the penalty that was applied earlier on to Bennett and uh, Christine GZ, uh, if, if they've sped, if they've been speeding in the pit lane, it's going to be a harsh penalty. Basically, it's, it's black and white, isn't it? Yeah, a, a it speeding is. in the pit lane, it, it's yeah, always been that way in every every kind of racing. Button, but it didn't go in. Uh, uh, so yeah, she yeah. called it, pressed it, but it didn't go in. Unfortunately, five seconds per kilometre. Yeah. So we'll find out from Scott Elkin shortly what they're going to do with this. So let's hear from them down on the ground. You looked incredibly fast out there. Could that be your best lap yet? <laughs> Thank you. Well, definitely it was. I mean, the thing is, on the practice round, we didn't have any power in the front. So last round was the first with full power. So I felt that I could push a little bit more this time. I uh, hope, hope it was an OK lap. I uh, just hope that we, we make a good time. And you're smiling. You looked happy on camera. <laughs> Did you enjoy it? Oh, was I smiling while driving? I love it. I didn't know. <laughs> well, I did enjoy it, so it was fun. Thank you very Definitely. much. Thank, Thank you. you. So that was Michaela Arlen Kotolinski saying she enjoyed it so much. Didn't even realise she was smiling. She was that into the zone. Uh, so she hands over to her teammates, Jensen Button, the number 22. If you're thinking that's familiar, it's because he raced it when he was in Formula One and won his championship as well as the number 22. So here's a nice comparison to make now. So Jensen is out on his second lap, and obviously he's been compared to uh, the leader Sebastian Loeb uh, and, and Gutierrez. But Gutierrez and uh, Arlen Kotlinski, we thought were, what, five or six seconds apart when they came in. There may be a penalty for speeding, but apart from that, you can see at the bottom there the difference in time between Loeb and Jensen. And it, it's, it is... OK, so there's Jensen Bunn. When that lights up at the bottom, that is using the hyperdrive. They're allowed to use it for up to four seconds on a lap, and it gives them a little bit of a power boost. So Sam Jensen's used that from one of the slowest parts on the course, heading into a long uphill section. Clever. Absolutely. Jensen will have experience with this from Kurs. If you remember Kurs on the Formula One cars, Kinetic Energy Recovery System, we had the opportunity to press a button. It would give us a boost out of the corners. So it's very, very similar technology. I think these guys are going to be really pleased to get a clean run, Jenny. The first time through, there's, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than a niggly fault. OK, a big shunt isn't what you want, but they had a niggly fault and it cost them 30-odd seconds. They were lucky to get a finish. They're in P5. If they get a penalty here, the key to be, is, is to be top six. If you're in the top six, there's a chance to fight for a place in the final. There's a chance to fight for the win of the first ever x Prix. But if you're in that bottom three, you're out. Remember, this is a team that came into it super late as well. So in terms of experience, this is a team that has less than everybody else and everybody else has little if none anyway so I yeah. think they're doing a good job to be honest
Really good job. You can see that is the command center. And Michaela's made her way back there. She's a little bit hot and bothered, but she's still talking about the button that yeah, she couldn't she depress the pit limiter. She's so frustrated within herself. She knew what she had to do. She did it, and it just didn't latch on properly. I think we're all waiting, unfortunately, to hear from Scott Elkins, aren't we? Who will, will come Scott. booming out <laughs> over the uh, over the system at some point and let us know that it's been a bit of a a bit of a shocker. But there you go. That's the way it goes. Jens Button can't worry about that. He's got to just get fully concentrated, nicely committed to it. Now needs to break for this section because you've got the dip. He's on the brakes pretty late. That's committed through there from Jensen. Get in. That's what we want to see. Last of the late breakers, isn't he? And it's, it rings true when you take the sport across from a discipline that's uh, on the circuit across to sand. Look at him come through this corner and kick up all that sand. I mean, as we say again, with three cars on track, you need to be out on front with just the one of them. Jensen Button has the luxury of being able to see exactly where he's going and take the position on the course that he wants to take. Jensen came out of that left-hander there and kept fairly tight into the rock face, Sam. Earlier on today, we were seeing some people come through the gate and take a wider line with maybe a bit more speed. A little bit more speed, but more distance. So there's, there's a trade-off at some point. If you take a tighter line, you're doing effectively less track. If you do a wider line but carrying more speed, you might be doing more meters, but in the end, it might average out. I wonder if everybody's being just slightly more cautious this afternoon. You know, you've got a one in seven chance, basically, of, of ending up in that in that bottom three. And the shootout, you, there's still going to be a shootout for position seven, eight, nine, but you can't make the final. And if, if you're in any of the banked positions, which certainly the top three, four probably are, Jensen Button, though, and Michaela Arlen Kotlinski are currently in P5 with Oli Bennett and Christine Jampola Zonka, who got that penalty, dropped it behind them. We don't really know their relative pace because Barton and Arlen Kotlinski had that stop on the first run. But I don't know. I just think at this point, if I were a team boss, I'd be saying there's, you know, only one team now is not going to make it because you, we know already that two teams are in that bottom two. Well, Button is the team boss. So yeah, he can, so he make, can that make that call. Shout from... He's behind the wheel. He can make his own call and control himself. So, but I don't know if you're better as a team manager at controlling other people than yourself. My, my concern <laughs> is who tells him off when he gets it wrong. Jensen will just be focusing on the job in hand, doing the <laughs> most professional job he can, bringing it home in one piece, but as quickly as he possibly can. Well, I think he's done a great job here. Effectively, it looked like he was four or five seconds behind as he went into the lap. And uh, if he's only lost that amount of time to Sebastian Loeb, a nine-time World Rally champion, I think that's progress from run one to run two. Button crosses the line and the clock is stopped 25.02. Gutierrez and Loeb lead from Arlen Kotlinski and Button. Loeb and Gutierrez were at the top of the leaderboard in Q1 for a long time. How long will they remain there this time? Real improvement from that team, though. If you go from uh, run one across to run two, I think they were about 50 seconds quicker. So a real improvement. And in terms of Jensen personally, looking at the, the times from Q1, it looks like he's found two to three seconds up against Sebastian Loeb. Right, as so you can see there, maybe Layla down on the ground is our pitch reporter and she will dive in to speak to Jensen Button to find out exactly what they think of the number 22's run. Jensen, an impressive run. How is it for you? Uh, yeah, it's tricky. It's getting very edgy and I think with because uh, we're running less power, um, it's actually trickier. So it's catching the ruts a lot more. And, and after what happened this morning in qualifying, I'm definitely taking it a little bit easier, but um, it was fun all the same. But yeah, I'm, I'm not putting it all out there. I'm just trying to get it round. Uh, and yeah, it, it felt OK. It wasn't are too you, bad at all. Are you saying the unsurprising statement that you prefer to drive faster? Um, yeah, but I'm used to having a bit more grip than this. This is a definite uh, surprise in the way that it feels. But um, no, it's uh, it's good fun. And uh, hopefully we can get some good data and see where we're, we're losing, because uh, I'm sure there's quite a bit. Thank you very much. Cheers, thanks. Off the line, Michaela Arlen Kotlinski on her run in Q2, hoping for a clean run compared to first time out when she spent about 30, 40 seconds at a standstill. For both. And we're Switch hearing speeding, from Scott Elkins with regard to that last run. Under investigation for both. 
Switch zone speeding and a switch time infraction. So okay. switch time infraction and pit lane speeding. That could be seriously heavy. This is the moment where it happened. You can see Kotlinski tried, but she couldn't get the pit button to work. So right, Jensen Matt, Button minute, had to pick up. He, he knew he had a mountain to climb because he probably knew what was coming. If we'd worked it out, he would have worked out, even though his eyes were on this um, car and making it go faster on the course. Super flustered, obviously came in, locked the wheels up. They, they send, then sounds like they've sent off too early. Um, so, you know, potentially penalties, well, I mean, what, what's the penalty? It's 25 Huge. seconds if it's an infraction, plus. plus the five per kilometre. So, let's see. Clean run, but maybe a penalty. Good morning. Well, Scott Elkin will be the man in there doing his addition. He'll have his calculator out and working out exactly how much it is. So, five seconds per kilometre speeding within the pit lane or the switch zone. Uh, and then you will have 25 seconds plus the amount of time gained in that switch area as well. So, that could be a hefty penalty, which could potentially drop that team down into the unlucky seventh place. So, the other teams actually might be looking at this with a sigh of relief, thinking, well, that's just made our life a whole lot easier absolutely so jenny now up i think was the driver of q1 katie munnings good shout sam katie with a puncture pretty early in the lap had to hang on to it for the entire of the rest of the run now i was asking you the question do you think she's looking after the car because when you have a tire down you can damage the suspension as well and you said no i think she's got it fully lit she and then, was going yeah. for it wasn't she and just seeing her there she's now got the the sunglass kind of visor strip. Um, she looked a bit like Robocop. She was so intense there. <laughs> looked super cool and concentrated as she sped off the line. I was trying to think of one of uh, Robocop's sayings there, but I'm afraid I'm not familiar. So, I can't uh, remember the no, name. Yeah, yeah, we'll look, we'll look do you see what up. I mean? Yeah, I do. So Katie Munnings now out on her lap, trying to get a clean run in. And this is her first chance as well to show her pace, Sam, because with a puncture, you know, we don't truly know how quick she was. Yeah, but you could see the car control. What she managed to do in the second last corner was phenomenal, holding on to a car that basically had three wheels. Yeah, great driving from Katie. Rally background. Yeah, absolutely. She knows what she's doing behind the wheel of this car. She looks pretty comfortable. Her and Timmy Hansen definitely managing to slot their car into fourth position in the first round. So let's see just how they can do in this section of the competition. Just giving it a bit of throttle. On board with Katie Munnings now, full concentration mode again. We're not seeing the tongue out quite the same way as we were before, Jenny. Maybe that only happens when she's hanging onto a car that's only got three tyres on it. But this this is full effort and big push. Trying to see, uh, we really want to be able to compare the times, don't we, in, in terms of sectors. Sam was uh, analysing sectors in between. I can see he's now he's buried in a piece of paper on the, uh, on the I desk love data. here. I, yeah. love data. I love data. You see, this is, a, <laughs> this is from a driver, isn't it? They're fascinated by it. So Katie's going to come round to the top of the cliff. She'll do the drop off after she's passed through the gate markers, through gate marker one. She'll take it far down. She went too far on the right last time, but that's because she had the puncture. No problem this time, and she's managed to nail it. I could argue you could go even deeper off that first crest and just be in the middle of the Road, but yeah, much less time lost than before. And before, this was the point, wasn't it? It was just after this that we saw it. It was the, the hairpin left where it suddenly flicked up the dirt, but we think potentially she had the puncture from much earlier in the run. Sam, what have you seen? Well, no, I just think it's very interesting. They've got a real fight on their hands to try and get up into the top three. Currently, the top three is Rosberg, Lewis Hamilton and Sainz. Andretti United really have an opportunity. If she can do a great first stint here, they can put themselves in a great position to put pressure on Sainz Exe. So rock hazard, it's saying, in a kilometre. I'd uh, argue there are rock hazards at most points on this course, Sam. I mean, it's, uh, this, is, this is absolutely littered with hazards. Well, every corner we've seen something happen, haven't we, pretty much? Interesting, the width of the track there, Jenny. It's super wide, but at the minute we're only seeing one line. Yeah, I don't know why they keep on taking exactly the same line. They've obviously gone away, thought about it with the engineers and decided that's the one they want to take. But there are so many variables, so many possibilities for them. And you're so, it's surprising that no one's just given it a little poke to see if there's a, a better option. But it's unforgiving in here. I love that section where they just bump over those curbs and really give it some air. But yeah, it, you, you just think they've only got one shot. Absolutely. Is there any point in risking it? Uh, I mean, they've got they've got a lot. I'm just trying to see what the time difference was between the two. It's only 15 seconds, so yes, there probably is. Although, I'm 
I'm going to be honest here. With, with with a couple of the teams out and potentially one of the both of those being pretty quick, there is an argument that if you're in that top final up against Loeb and uh, Gutierrez, up against Christopherson and Taylor, you've got a real battle on your hands. Now, if you were to end up in the crazy race, potentially, Jenny, you're oh. going to come up against people who are slightly less experienced. If you feel you've got the measure of them, you know, it might not be a bad thing if you end up in there, as long as you win the start. You're very tactical. That's a rally as a cross driver, thing. Yeah. you must have been tactical. I'm getting it. I'm getting that it's about the strategy. For me, I'm just an out and out. Go as fast as I can and see what happens I afterwards and see where the mix lay. I don't think I don't think they'll lift for it. I don't think they're going to aim to be in it, but I think they're not going to risk it to try desperately to get into the main final because I think they'll have looked at it and gone, do you know what? Worst case scenario, we might be the favourites in the crazy race. We have seen the damage this course can create on your car. If you don't get it spot on if you just if you're just out a little bit then you can risk losing the car and losing your whole runtime from that session and at this point you've just got to make sure you get to the finishing line in the best possible way you can but just get it there Sam haven't you you've got to secure your future in the competition <laughs> I think they're going for p3 that's that's what I would be doing now if I'm in that car I'm wanting to hunt down the science XC team on, on the basis of there being two positions available in the first semi-final, because I'm looking at the people that are in P5 and P6 and thinking I'd fancy Hansen and Bunnings against them in turn one. <sighs> it's funny, but the thing is they can't predict it anyway because the other teams could have a problem. It's But it's about, I suppose what we're talking about here is risk management, isn't it? Is is how, how, do you, how much risk do you take? And they will have looked at the permutations and gone, we can go either way. Right, this is the switch zone. So let's have a look what happens because we're going to get the handover from Munnings to Hansen. She's on the pit limiter, so she's managed that for part first successfully. So Timmy Hansen is standing by the 2019 World Champion and FIA World Rally Cross and just looking at them, waving her in. This is the first time she's done this side of the switch before, of course, she was getting into the car. Now she's got to get out. She's the shorter of the drivers just it's into uh, into neutral she jumps out the car timmy's going to jump in jenny we noticed Timmy, there are four teams where the drivers are both are very equal height and four teams where there's a massive difference between them the seat won't move for you guys at home if you miss session number one the seat doesn't slide backwards and forwards like it does in your road car it's bolted into position so you have to do it with an insert and the belt yeah no insert for these two though they are such a similar build and stature that they're able to just get in the same car you see him pulling on those straps making sure he's in he has to wait for the full 45 seconds before is able to pit, put the power button again. <laughs> Katie, what was the game plan for that lap and how close to the game plan did it go? Yeah, I mean, you've always got to see how it goes out there. The course is changing all the time. Um, for me, though, it was, some of those sections is the first time I've actually driven it fast because in the shakedown we were yellow flagged and then last run I had a puncture, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's the way it is, but um, yeah, it's good to finally get a clean lap. Um, just small mistakes on my part from the driving side, but yeah, nothing too, nothing too massive. So just keeping it tidy and hopefully he has a good lap now. Thank you very much. Hansen used the hyperdrive away from the start zone for this super long straight. Tactical decision, one of the fastest parts on the circuit. You know, the fact we've got the graphic is probably quite frustrating for the teams, Jenny, because I imagine they're thinking, oh, come on, like, we had a good idea here, don't give it away. <laughs> if they wanted to keep it secret, Squirrel, can't do that because we want to bring you the very best of this championship and that means opening the doors so you know what's going on and you're in the driver's seat, just like Timmy Hansen. We'll get you as close as we can. And interesting from Katie as well about the yellow flag and, and the puncture, fair play. Yeah, she had, a, she had an uphill battle, quite literally, but she's managed it really <laughs> well. So let's see what Hansen can do. We can see quite clearly he needs to claw back some time if they're going to get this P3 or even challenge beyond that. So now we're comparing uh, Hansen against, obviously, Button and Lowe, but it, I'm guessing that this is the accumulative time, so it's the, the effect of both. So at the minute, they would be in P2. And I suppose it, we're looking at relative pace. Go on, Sam. I don't think so, because Jensen um, and his teammate are not 25 seconds overall behind Sebastian Loeb. They're quite a bit more. What I can say is that Timmy Hansen in the first two, uh, one, two kilometers of the course has lost five, six seconds to bed compared to Sebastian Loeb, which is a bit of a surprise. 
know where he's losing that time either. It doesn't seem completely clear to me. Both Hudson and Munning slightly slower than I would have expected. I, yeah, I think we're, I'll be honest, I think we're misreading the timing screen here. I think it's difficult to know exactly where they are. It's, uh, we're not, in terms of the gap at the bottom, we're not quite sure on that, whether it's, whether it's both at the point we're at at the minute. Um, we know we don't have combined times for the session. That comes at the end of this, and that's what they'll do, is they'll add the times from the session. So, yeah, I suppose Loeb and Gutierrez are hoping, aren't they, to be uh, slightly quicker than Rosberg Racing's pairing of Christofferson and Taylor. They, that, that's the one to watch. They're 4.5 seconds apart. Just to reiterate how it works is all of the times from the first part of qualifying, which we had earlier this morning, get added to the second qualifying times, and whoever leads from that aggregate, uh, whoever leads from that time, is the one that is on top and will uh, go go through tomorrow having won the qualifying rounds and took those 12 points. Hansen with a deep breath as he goes through the compression there. He's coming up now to the point where you have to break hard and he pushes over that crest. Still the most impressive driver over that crest was Molly Taylor earlier on today who, who flicked the rear end of the car very high up indeed. This is now the left-hander. Let's see if Timmy takes the tight line or carries the speed and lets the car run wide. I can't tell from there, but he's looking pretty chilled. Similar line to Jensen, I'd say, tight on the exit, looking at his way, and that's to get a nicer line into this next gate. Tell you what, Molly Taylor's first run was impressive. It was fire. Second run. <laughs> oh, no. Well, on the other hand, Jenny, she might wind it in a bit. Oh, come on, safety. Nah. I don't like it. No, just but go I, out I and out. risk management. I know we're very different people. It's so. Oh, it's just, it's just our you? backgrounds, Jenny. That's all <laughs> it is. We're, we're bringing them all together here in a, in a lovely sandy uh, course in the middle of Saudi Arabia, um, trying desperately to convert as many people as we can to uh, the off-road side. I tell you what, Hanson's good through that section. Was good through there last time. This is one of those sections that's really cut up. Look at the deep hole in the middle here. Sand oh. up over the screen. Oh. So now the front, and that means that the front end of the sump guard, which is what would traditionally protect the sump of the engine. Of course, we've got electric motors. So there's actually a bit more space and a bit more ground clearance. Another advantage of, of an electric SUV. But it's digging in, Sam, and chucking the sand up over the top of the car. That was not an issue this morning. Exactly. That's how much the track has evolved and changed. Do you know, I looked at it and thought it looks like someone's taken a bucket through it and built a nice sandcastle on the side because those ruts are so deep now, but it's it's going to get deeper and deeper every run. You wanted to go earlier in this run rather than later. The people that are going to run later in this qualifying session could well be penalised through just going through that big hole. Left and onto the track at the bottom. At the moment, it's showing them as 23 seconds. Down overall time of Arlen Kotlinski and Button is 11.32. So going to be very close between these two. So Arlen Kotlinski and Button, where are they going to stop the clock? It's going to be super close between them. They just get it okay, by a tiny margin. That's a couple of hundreds. Over over 8.8 .8 kilometers times two. We're talking about nearly seven, more than 17 kilometers. Munnings and Hansen have just gone two hundredths quicker on this run. That is incredibly close. You can't quote credit it can you because actually when it comes to the the distance that that would be you couldn't you couldn't split them in a race it would be exactly the same that is an incredible achievement from those cars now interestingly looking at it i think when uh, katie came in that she was potentially a few seconds back and that means that timmy has probably taken a few seconds off gents and they've ended up very close together indeed carlos you had a great first qualifier what's the plan now well, try to do the same, try to make a good run without no mistakes and, you know, try to see if we can, uh, I think the, the guys in front are a little bit far, so we need to try to keep uh, at least a position third. Are we going full power? Are we going fast? Yeah, we will see. <laughs> Thank you. Attention all teams, attention all teams, from the stewards. Decision has been made We're waiting to hear from Scott Elkins here. For the Pit lane speed infringement. There's a penalty of 150 seconds. Whoa, 150 that's massive. 150. An that's two minutes 30. The, time, the penalty is 25 and a half seconds. 25.5 seconds. Oh, for a total wow. 175.5 seconds penalty. Nearly three minutes. 180 is three minutes. That's two minutes 30, Jenny, for the speed and 25.5. So the 0.5 is the advantage. They only went half a second early and they got a 25 second penalty for that. But the speed, <laughs> how fast were they going in there? 
fast. It's a good job it isn't a cash one, isn't it? You know when you get fined for it, Sam? That would that's, that'd hurt, wouldn't it? Uh, I feel, you know, they... Oh, again, I'm gutty for them, really. I think Michaela did a super job. Yes, yeah, so do I. driven a great stint and just one press of a button can, yeah. can hurt you so much. Just to clarify, that was for Jensen Button's team, the number 22 car. So it looks like they'll be rooted down into seventh place. Two cars not going to be taking part in this qualifying session, we expect, after heavy damage from those impacts in the first part of qualifying. If you haven't one seen minute. them yet, probably worth checking them out on the Extreme E website or on social media. Munnings and Hansen on their run in Q2. Katie Munnings went out first. Katie not having had a clean go at the lap at all. Uh, she said yesterday that there, some of it was yellow flag. Today, of course, she fought that puncture for the whole of the second lap. Lost a little bit of time to Arlen Kotlinski, who uh, had had her issue in the morning and lost 30 seconds going slowly. But then Timmy Hansen with a big push to try and make that time up, Jenny. Yeah, absolutely. They gave it on the switch, both similarly heighted, so no inserts having to be made. But Hansen having a really exemplary drive, managing to, as you say, claw back time. Do a really good job out there. Of course, more experience to this sort of ground underneath them and getting the car to rock and roll around. But a really impressive display from Munnings and Hansen. Off the line, Axiona Sainz. This time it should be Lyra Sands who's in the car because we spoke to Carlos Sainz a few moments ago in the command centre. Now, Lyra was, was very impressive last time. Interestingly, Jenny, Carlos saying we're aiming for third. Well, let's see if they can pull it off. Oh, equally, they are using that hyperdrive off the start line. So that's a tactic that clearly a lot of the teams have decided to focus on, using it on the flats, the best part of the... the course to use it on really sam we, we discussed it, it Where did, what, what about the uphill section sam you there, there are two places i think you should use it one of them obviously off the start line once you've kind of got your traction to a to a relatively good space the other is the uphill uphill section towards the the, the crest and the downhill section this is a section when I first saw it that I was so excited about Extreme E because if you just switched your telly on right now and you're watching this, that bumping up and down, the aggressive nature of these cars, the Odyssey 21 designed for all-terrain SUV and the electric power of it just all comes together and it, it sings. Yesterday, me and Jenny were really lucky when we got to watch every single run through uh, the, the shakedown session and the first car on track was actually Sarah Price for Chip Ganassi Racing. She was the first driver to be signed for the series. Uh, female driver being the first driver was really cool, and uh, it was quite fitting that she went out and she sent it, Jenny, didn't she? Over that first whoop section, the car was in the air, and we were like, OK, this is going to be awesome. If you can imagine a mogul run, it was just like that, with the car bouncing around and just really fighting for grip. This is the other favourite section of mine. It is the drop-off. They come up that hill. You've got to be careful. Both sides of that ravine, danger. You've got to place it right here to get the best run out of that hill. Nicely done from Sands. Clattering at the bottom of the hill. So that's why we're seeing some of the drivers run just a little bit of left foot on the brake as they come to the compression. It's, it's significant. 150 kilometres now. They're just taking the edge off that impact. Sans has done a really solid job so far today. She was only middle mid sector in Q1. She was only nine seconds off the great Carlos Sainz. So I think this is a really strong driver pairing. Carlos Sainz was uh, was was really pushing hard as well this morning, Sam. Flamboyant. But, yeah, but yeah, again, it was because it wasn't again, quick as well. Would was we it? expect anything less? No, but it was spectacular. We don't yeah. we don't mind losing time if it looks awesome. Oh, absolutely. So you can see Sands more used to two wheels than four. This is her first real official tour out in a com competitive state in four wheels, but she is doing a great job in that car and really bragging it around this course, telling it who's boss and really showing the 8.8 .8 kilometers she's got in tune with. Interestingly, Lia Sainz went up, well, sorry, Lia Sands went up with Christina Giampolazonka to uh, do some ice driving with the Ericsson brothers, a couple of rallycross drivers, they went and drove an RX2 car on the frozen lakes, and that would have been a huge help in her transition between Jenny riding a motorbike, which is, you know, rear-wheel drive only, and, and the way that it handles is completely different to a car. Um, you know, most of these guys would be absolutely terrible on a bike. She'd 
she would destroy them. She'd smash them on a bike. And I kind of want to see that, but the but but it's a completely different thing. So everybody's done their prep. Some have driven on sand, some have driven on ice, but for her, particularly time in a car would have been really crucial. We always talk about the battle, don't we? Those on two, those on four wheel. Can you make the crossover? Valentino Rossi and Lewis Hamilton yeah. famously, you know, made the switch, but it was only like a, a bit of a fun thing for them, although there's nothing over fun, is there? They both take it quite seriously. But the chat was that Rossi at some point would like to make the switch over to Formula One. He test drove, it never happened. But wow, the, the skill set, I think, is easier for a bike to go over to car than car into bike. Yeah, definitely. But partly because of the exposure. Yeah, you'll, you'll find that motorcyclists, when they get in a car, are like, oh my God, it feels so safe. <laughs> uh, whereas going the other way, like I was always imp hugely impressed by Lewis taking on the, the MotoGP bike of, of Rossi. Like, fair go. That is impressive. Lewis is really, really impressive. Lewis is a big fan of the motorbike, though. He's got lots of them and he rides them very well. It's just the muscle memory that if you're a biker, you've got it in your arms and it doesn't hurt so much. If you're a, if you're a driver and you get on to ride, it's pain all the way through for you. He needs to head down to Valentino Rossi's ranch, doesn't he, and uh, get out there on the flat track. That's what we want to see, Lewis. Get yourself down there. Come on, get over. I kind of want to see Lewis in one of these as well. You know, let's let's get Lewis and Nico in for a lap here and there. At the minute, I think they'll have to fight their uh, their own drivers to get out, wouldn't they? You, you know, Christofferson doing a brilliant job for uh, Rosberg and Loeb doing a brilliant job for Hamilton. You, you, you'd argue, I think, if either of them jumped in the car, Jenny, they potentially wouldn't be able to match that pace yet. Yeah, why would you want to show yourself up, uh, quite yeah. frankly, because these guys are doing such a good job. Lia Sands coming into this changeover zone. This is the bit that Carlos Sainz Sr. was worried about. He just wanted it to be a bit slower, a bit more genteel, but... He's not got his wish, really, because it's uh, still a fairly competitive uh, handover with a 45-second switch. They're down on the pit limiter coming in, and she'll find her bay, pull in, and there is the Matador. It just seems so frustratingly slow, Sam. This is this is something you're familiar with, you know, the crawling down the pit lane. You put everything into gaining every tenth, and then suddenly, you're, you know, you're at walking pace. It is frustrating, but... Um... It's, it's one of the most critical parts of the race, actually, the, the, the changeover, breaking for the pits. Can you extract more than your rivals? But you don't want to go out too far, as we've seen some people get penalties. So Carlos going for the head-first approach to get into the car. Sometimes you stick the right leg in first and then drop your bum into the seat, pull the left leg in, but it's quite a high side. Obviously, the drivers are using... They're standing on the step, effectively, where the goal wing door comes down onto. Lai giving a thumbs up there, obviously not needing too much assistance with the belts. Difficult to get two people into the one space, that's why in endurance racing it's your co-driver that helps you, your teammate that helps you out, but they've managed to do it, door closed, so they'll have a quick look across to the time, and just check, in fairness, Lai looked pooped, she looks like that was hard work for her, she needs to get out of that zone. I'm not sure Lai needed to get this this side of the wall, I, 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 hopefully there won't be a penalty for that, but... Let's I think we're going to have her. a chat, yeah. We'll just try and catch up with her in just a moment as we watch Carlos Sainz take to the course. OK, let's go down and hear from Laia Sands. Laia, tell us, how was that for you? Yeah, I think for the moment it's been a good day. Uh, seeing what is happening uh, this morning, I, I decided to take it easy. Also, again now because we were in a in a good position, and, I, and hopefully uh, we can have a we can get to the semi-final. Is the large part of the focus here making sure we finish the race? Sorry. Is the large part of the focus making sure you finish safe? Yeah, uh, you know it's the races are so short. You cannot do any mistakes. I'm learning, so I need to take my time and, and trying to to help the team as much as possible. And how much did you enjoy it? Yeah, it's fun. Uh, I, I'm used to the sun, but but of course it's a completely different way to, to drive. So I'm, I'm just learning. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Tell you what, she did a cracking job for Oscars. someone who can <laughs> counts herself as learning. I was really impressed with Leia Sands. I wish I could learn like that. That, that ship sailed about 25 years ago, I'm afraid of the whole learning thing. <laughs> That's long gone. I've seen you drive. Yeah, I know, mate, yeah. <laughs> There's no hope for any of us. 
Right, Carlos is in the car. He's going to go to the drop zone. You can just see he's going quite far to the left, quite close to that rock face, through the gates, down, across. This is a 100-metre drop at 45 degrees. I think you can afford to take that crest, as Carlos did, more quickly. And I think a number of the drivers are falling into the trap of lifting early because it's because it, they can't see and they're not sure where they're going. It's sand. The second you lift, it sucks all of the speed out of the car. You can wait really late. You've got gravity with you, you're going uphill, and you've got sand. Stop late. Carry the speed over the crest, get deep, and then off that second crest as well. But, you know, this is something science has done a lot more of in cars than, than sand. It was great to hear her comparing the bike to the car just like we were earlier. I tell you what, when it comes to people driving on the sand, Dakar, these two have got it pretty sussed, haven't they? It's just a different kind of discipline, but that that mindset of knowing, as you say, Andrew, how the sand will react. You know what tarmac's going to do. It's going to rubber in, it's going to get green, it's going to get better as the weekend goes on. This totally different kettle of fish. This is a pairing that, I, when I looked at it, I always thought they'd qualify quite well. The only thing, maybe, is can they race well? Yes, That's going to be the thing. Great why wouldn't, point. Just tell people at home why they wouldn't be able to race well, potentially. Science was late on the brakes there through that section. Go on, Sam. Yeah, I, I, I thought the rally, same. In rallying and in Dakar, you're not necessarily fighting on track with a load of other competitors. It's a time trial. So this is a slightly different discipline. Right now, you're seeing the time trial element of it in qualifying, which is what they used to. Tomorrow, they've got to overtake people. They've got to go in wheel-to-wheel -wheel combat, and that will actually be a first time for the, some of these drivers. That was Sainz uh, taking on the section he took on so beautifully this morning. Maximum attack through there. He's, he's pushing hard. While we were talking to Liar earlier on, you could see through the first section of the course, he really was pushing very hard. Coming up towards the top of the sand dunes now. Again, this is something Carlos has done a lot of. Three Dakar wins with three different manufacturers. This is where Loeb dropped off to the side of the course yesterday, just to the, the far side of where Carlos is now from where we are. And it got pulled down the edge of the dune, but no problems for Carlos. And Jenny, the big hole again. Not so much stand up over the top. Carlos went left rather than in the middle. Yeah, I think the more you watch, if you can watch and be the second driver, you can highlight the problem areas and maybe avoid them with the second one. Again, some lovely air there for Carlos. He's making up time. He was 11 seconds back and he's gone back up the other way. It's just around the 11, under 11 second mark. So Sainz trying to make up time. But to be honest with you, if I were the team, I might be on the radio now going, look, you are definitely going to go P2 because you're way quicker than the two previous cars. It's just Loeb and Gutierrez who are right up at the top of the table. Carlos has got this under control. He's driving this, the wheels off this car, driving beautifully, looks so in control. It does look flamboyant, but it's wonderful to watch as he goes around the other side of yes, that Yes, Sam. Different entrance, different wasn't it, entrance. onto the road? Basically carrying more speed. up the exit a little bit by doing that. And funny enough, lost a second or so there. Backs it in again through this section. Coming up now, going to stop the clock, and I think go P2. They're about 12 seconds back, and they do. Just under 13 seconds, the gap between Gutierrez and Loeb. Sands and Sainz slot in. Great drive. Really good stuff there. Really impressive from Sands and Sainz, the all-Spanish team from Axiona. And uh, they will be, I think they'll be pretty happy with a second on the road at the moment. Of course, they've got some big hitters still to come. They've got the likes of Rosberg racing with Christofferson and Taylor, but uh, happy days, I would think, for Leia and for Carlos. That's a great drive, isn't it? Look at the margin. Yeah, that's 12 seconds ahead. The other two were close together as a pairing. You've got to look at these guys as a pairing. In really interesting what Sam said about the racing, and I completely agree. Interestingly, of course, Sam, they will have had to pass people in the dunes on because in the Dakar, you catch people a lot. They go at one minute intervals and then the, the stage is five hours long. So they will have done a lot of that. But those people are not trying to keep you behind them. That's the difference. That is the difference. It's, it's they are overtaking you and that's fine and they will let you pass. This now is going to be wheel to wheel combat tomorrow. And that is a different thing. There will be door banging. There will be action in the pack and it will be frenetic. And the start 
looks so very different. When you've got three cars lined up and you've got that sand waiting to kind of try and pull you back towards it, you've got to make sure you're in the bay that you want if you can select it because grid play comes into action. You've got to try and get a clean getaway. There are so many things to think about. I've been thinking about bay selection, Jenny, and I really think it's not going to be anything to do with where the bay is because turn one is so far away. I think it's going to be which bay has the most traction. And that, that sounds ridiculous when we're talking about sand and gravel, but I, I would want either the bay on the left or the bay on the right. I don't want to be the bay in the middle because A, I'm going to have the spray from the cars around me coming onto, and also you could get sandwiched between the two. The guy on the outside could do a switchback going towards the second phase of the track. The guy in the middle could, could be left with nowhere to go. Very tricky indeed. We're going to find out about uh, Bay Selection tomorrow when we go racing, but a little bit more qualifying still to come. Well, we're down in the command centre. That is uh, Chip Ganassi who's making a call. So there we are. We'll watch the highlights of this run by Saints and Sands. And it was Leia who went in first and she did a cracking job. You can just see her really wrestling that Odyssey 21 using all the skill set she's got from her uh, trial world trial world championships, the Enduro and the Dakar to try and get this car turned in just the two wheels, uh, four wheels and not the two that she's used to, but you can see how they've looked at these gates. They've positioned and they've worked out what the best line is for them to take to try and get around this as fast as they possibly can. Great drive from both of them. That was the changeover. No problems at all. And you could see immediately how hard Science was pushing. Look at that, really. And then over the crest again, this is where he was carrying so much momentum. And barely dropped below 100 kilometers an hour over the crest, Jenny, before coming down at around 150. Over the road crossing again, just gives you a good idea of how three-dimensional this is. You know, when, when the landscape's at 45 degrees, you know you're on it. Yeah, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. I think his son will be pretty happy that he's sporting the number 55 uh, for that red car. So familiar, red and science. Now, Sam, I believe we had a message this morning, didn't we, from uh, Carlos Sainz Jr.? Yeah, I spoke to Carlos on, on WhatsApp and he said, my dad is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's any new fans to rallying and, and obviously new fans to Extreme E, please go on YouTube and, and check out Carlos Sainz highlights. Yeah. The Carlos Sainz Senior highlights and you will see some marvellous clips from the 90s and, and 2000s of him absolutely hustling some cars in extreme conditions like this. Imagine in 25 years when someone Googles Carlos Sainz and they're like, wow, this guy did a lot. <laughs> they're going to be seeing all the F1 stuff, you know, they're going to need to make sure they put the junior on there, aren't they? I say there are people who love F1 who would never have heard of Carlos Sainz, but when, he's the original. When people Google me and type in Sam Bird, they get Love Island pictures. <laughs> Do so, they really? Yeah, well, there was the guy from Love Island called Sam Bird. Oh, so mate, that must I'm have knocked you right him. down the Google standings, uh, didn't I'm, it? I'm thousands of pictures down. <laughs> Devastating. <laughs> Absolutely things, shocking. Things you learn from commentary that you never know, knew you yeah. never needed to know. There we go, lovely images of Alula, the base for us in Saudi Arabia. And you can see the paddock there, a temporary structure. When they go, it'll all be cleaned away. They'll leave in a better state than they found it. Legacy being one of the key messages of the brand new championship that is Extreme E. And we're delighted to be bringing you coverage of Kuala. Well, While you join us with just a couple of cars left to run in Q2, Alula in Saudi Arabia, but it was Sebastian Loeb and Christina Gutierrez who started the session off. Gutierrez in the car first time out for Lewis Hamilton's X44. The drivers have to run in this session in the reverse order, Jenny, from the previous session. So everybody sent the male driver out in the last session, uh, except for, was it Excite, I think? I think it was all of the Bennett um, went out. So, yeah, absolutely. So they're the other team that will switch it around. This, the switch, Loeb getting in and taking on this 8.8 kilometre course and absolutely flying. It really was a masterclass from Loeb. Yeah, no, no problems for a nine-time... Uh, World Rally Champion, brilliant. Crossing over the road, coming towards the end of his run, the Frenchman looking as relaxed as normal, and it was them who went straight to the top of the table. Benchmark, 
And uh, we will catch you guys later on. There's more racing action coming tomorrow, if you're leaving us. And we have just uh, a few cars remaining here in Q2, Saudi Arabia. Jensen Button and uh, Michaela Arlen Kotlinski. Earlier on today, Arlen Kotlinski was in the car first of all. But uh, it didn't go well at the driver changeover, did it, Jenny? No, it certainly didn't. She hit the pit limiter button. It didn't work or something went wrong with it. That caused the delay. Then they were caught. Um, so they caught speeding and then they left too early just by a fraction of a second. But unfortunately, it meant they got a big penalty, 175 second penalty, <laughs> almost three minutes. Takes them out of the running and plants them fairly in the seventh position. That is the last position. And it means that they won't be able to go through to fight for a place in the final race tomorrow if it stays like this. If it stays like this, indeed, yeah, we got. I guess it's going to depend if any of the other teams would have a DNF that could see them drop back. But yeah, they're in danger, aren't they? Absolutely. This was Munnings and Hansen. Katie Munnings out in the car first of all. She hadn't had a full lap of the track. She'd had a puncture and a yellow flag yesterday. Lost a few seconds in comparison to Michaela Arlen Kotlinski. Timmy Hansen jumped in and gained a few seconds back. They ended up just two hundredths of a second of a. Uh, off the time of, of Button at the time. Unfortunately, since then, Button's been given a penalty of about half an hour. Yes, yeah, striking similarities to those drives and the ability that they were able to show, which I think is credit to the Button team, really. If you so look at what they've done so far today, the limited running that they've had and the trajectory of learning that they've got to go through this weekend. On to the Axiona Sainz team. This was Leia Sands and Carlos Sainz taking to the track. Great job they did. So we're now back live in Saudi Arabia. Pictures coming to you from the uh, run of it's Chris Stobson and uh, I'm just trying to see who's in the car at the moment. Chris Stobson is in the car, so this is just 0.75 of a second off the lead. Johan Christopherson and Molly Taylor then must have had an absolutely storming first lap. It's Gutierrez and Loeb versus Taylor and Christopherson trying to figure out just where Johan is on the course. He's up at the top section where Loeb ran off yesterday, Jenny. Yeah, so this is where they uh, get thick. Oh, no, so he's no, not. no, it's, 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 it's at the drop. It's at the drop off. So they're going up to gate three and four. So they go through this over the cliff getting some very nice air there Christofferson I'm really keen on watching these two Christofferson and Taylor a class act and they really are challenging the X44 team of Lewis Hamilton with Loeb and Gutierrez Christofferson just has the car so steady and planted there was only four and a half seconds in it between these two cars in qualifying round one round one going to Christofferson's car and Molly Taylor's car so right now they're just eking away that advantage a little bit more so they they could in the last minute or so take it a little bit easier bring the car home at this stage it's advantage Rosberg sideways for Christopherson into that dip we've just and he does come out the <laughs> other side we saw that on day one didn't we and it was like where have they gone okay everything's fine when they pop back up into vision again here comes Christopherson over the dune section fully committed so as Sam said four and a half seconds between them bear in mind that's over 8.8 .8 kilometers twice so we're talking over 17 plus kilometers and there was that one mistake from Sebastian Loeb on his first run where he dropped off the side of the sand how much has that cost them well, Christofferson's fully committed Sam. we thought it cost him about five to six seconds didn't we right now what's the gap five or six seconds oh, you'd be gutted it wouldn't is you so close yeah. out there between these two would you have thought it would be this close no absolutely not and i am loving it this is the adrenaline filled sport that we were told about at the very beginning of the concept and my word it is coming to fruition as you can see christopherson oh just getting it right up on the side if you haven't been following us so far that is what extreme is all about taking it to the limit i think christopherson's got more pace than he's showing looking at what he did yesterday during shakedown when he was absolutely lit but i would say potentially you know right high on the risk scale today still going quickly enough and again the team can be on the radio to him and can say look we had four and a half if they finish equal that's it they take that top qualifier spot but of course it then comes down to votes as to whether or not they actually get the best spot on the grid uh, no semi-final it won't will it they'll get to they'll get to choose is he wide through there comes in different line big looks, impact looks a bit scrappy actually he's just losing the rear end here and there sam how do you call it well there he had a big hit on the loaded rear tire and it sent the car the wrong way he's then got to gather the car up but he's lost momentum so that's cost him a bit and as you can see 
Actually, he's gone quicker. I'm talking a little <laughs> bit. He's easy on the big. This is what oh, I just, mean. Don't this worry is... about me, everybody. I'm talking a load of nonsense. This, this, this to me is Christofferson a little bit more like we saw yesterday, Jenny, on Shakedown. I think there's just a bit of a push here. Bit more pace coming in. They took four and a half off them. I wonder if they're laying down a little bit of a marker to the other teams, because that's what you want. You want them going in tonight, looking at the times and going, do you know what? Tomorrow's going to be hard work. Final part of the run as he brings it through these two gates. So the road section, then he'll swing it left into the end zone where the switch area is just clipping onto the side of that gate. Perfectly called it. And here he is. Loeb goes through for the finish. And can he make it to the leader? And it's Christofferson who takes Loeb for first place. So Christofferson and and Taylor do it. They get the 12 points and they absolutely nail this first qualifying day. What a drama it was right until the end. Super, super tight. 4.6 seconds in this run, 4.5 seconds in the run earlier. And it would have been much, I think, without Loeb's mistake. If the mistake was five, it's whether the momentum afterwards was any more. But either way, Christopherson and Taylor have got the job done. The Same. Oh. From the, the stewards. For Rosberg is 60 seconds, <gasps> 44 kilometers per hour in the switch zone. So that's a penalty for Christopherson and Taylor. Seconds, a penalty has taken the Speeding leaders from the top the of the zone. board and is going to drop them down. 44 kilometers per hour they were over. What's the number of Lewis Hamilton's car? 44. And that's the car that takes the lead and takes the 12 points and wins qualifying. Gutierrez and Loeb catapulted back up with that penalty. Let's hear from them. Nico Rosberg, we've just heard about a 60 second penalty for speeding in the switch lane. Tell us your reaction. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're learning our way huh? as a team, as drivers, there's so much going on. And then uh, apparently they say that there was a small mistake there with a or a small problem. Let's not say mistake, a small problem with the pit lane limiter, because uh, Molly. He said it was Well, apologies there. We've just uh, lost our connection with that camera. We'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Disappointment for Rosberg. So, Christopherson and Taylor were top of the table. Um, unseen by us, they, they were speeding in the switch zone, uh, by significantly speeding in the switch zone. And that's dropped them down after all that hard work. What's the penalty? 60 seconds. I'm trying to see if it's going to put them into the clutches of Sainz and Sands. I don't think it will. What was the gap this morning? It was nearly 30. It's the, it's the accumulative time from Q1 and Q2. They take the times of, of both drivers run, so the complete two lap run, and they add them together. So effectively, it's four laps of the circuit, and that gives us the order. But plus then the penalty. I think uh, they are just under. I think they're going to be able to stick on to second place by about 12 or 14 seconds in the end of that. Won't matter, will it? As long as they make the top three, they'll be disappointed. But being in that, they're going to be in the same semi semi-final they were in before. But do you want as well better to make the mistake now? I suppose they, they may be going to ditch a couple of championship points, Jenny. But, you know, for those who've made the mistake and then it's dropped them completely out of the running, it's, it's dropped them out of any chance for a good result this weekend. You've not rolled the car, you know? It's not yeah. terrible. Damage limitation, isn't it, at this three point minutes, in time? Three minutes. So the first team in this qualifying get 12 points. Second, 11 points. 10 points for the third place. And then you go to fourth, fifth, sixth on nine, eight, and seven. And then six, five, and four points for the teams that classify in seventh, eighth, and ninth. And that is both of the times for both drivers added from qualifying one and qualifying two. Uh, and you can see at the moment, the penalty not been put up on that position, but Taylor Christofferson showing the lead at an 11.03.258. But with that penalty, for 44 kilometers per hour over, they will shuffle backwards, and that will be painful. Christopherson won't like that, will he? No, they won't, because it's a, it's a, it's an avoidable mistake, and it's not a mistake out on circuit. You know, we don't know which driver was responsible for it, whether it was Taylor on the way in or Christopherson on the way. We haven't had that information, and um, we didn't see them uh, in in the switch zone. So for us earlier, it was a little bit more obvious, wasn't it, when we saw the problems for Arlen Kotlinski. She came in, locked the wheels up, and then I think Jensen said, didn't he, too fast. He just he spotted it on the way. I think you heard that, didn't you, Jenny? Yeah, absolutely. He spotted that straight away. And uh, I think a lot of these teams will have to get their heads around these pit limiters, work out what they're doing, what they're not quite doing right, maybe just not nailing it. But we're getting ready for our next run. This will be car 42, Hispano Suiza XI Energy Team. This is Christine GZ in the uh, 
command centre and Oliver Bennett, 28 year old from Bristol, will be taking the start. The only one of the teams that actually switched up strategy and decided to send their male first and their female second. So let's see how this goes for them. They're in Bay 1 when it comes to the racing tomorrow. Let's see where they start then. But for now, let's see the traction they get off the line. Bennett looking for the green light on those two stands either side. Once it does go green, he's off and we're just waiting on uh, one car left to run after this. We've still got Chip Ganassi, Segi TV to run. One minute. one minute we're hearing from race control, so still a minute to go. Right. What's key here is, is what's up for grabs in terms of who's going to make it into the top six. So bear in mind that Cooper, Apt Cooper XE and Veloce Racing have got a DNF, that's a did not finish, and a DNS. They did not start this session due to damage on the car from session number one. So effectively, there is only one car from those that are running in this session that is not going to make it. We've seen some penalties. We'll get some maths on the go at this end if we can, and we'll try and figure out who's going to drop into that P7. It's like, you know, some dramatic music terrible from a terrible game show. <laughs> it's, you know, it, it's going to be... It's going to be a shocker if you end up down there. Yeah, absolutely. And I hate maths as well. It looks likely at this rate, but it will be the button car with Michaela Arlen Kosolinski and Jensen Button. They picked up a hefty penalty, 175 seconds. seconds. Ouchy time. But still, this isn't over yet. So let's see what happens. Not so long now before we send Ollie Bennett off the line. You want to... All still to play for. So Bennett heads off the line. If you're not going to manage to see the end of this session, then you can catch up with the highlights later on tonight, which will show you just what happened in qualifying. See who made it into the top six. They're going to battle for those places in the semi-finals and the final tomorrow. Bennett flat out on the run down to turn one, Jenny. So uh, I say this was the one team that ran the female driver first, Christina Giampazonka. GZ, GZ, we're going to have to decide on that, aren't we? GZ is easier to say. We'll ask, I'll ask her. We'll send her a voice message and see Should what we she comes back with. Well, it, I, I did ask how to say her surname, and she just sent back, just say GZ, and I'm like, OK, but, but I think she typed it. I need a voice message for these things, you know? We need to know how you're thinking. <laughs> you love a voice message. I do love a voice note, I'm afraid. Anyway, Oliver in the car right now, and it'll be GZ that's watching on, biting her nails as she sees what they can do around this course. Rally cross driver um, racing the number 42, and he's carried that over here. Christine said she was more than happy to take that number. That is America's Rallycross debut in 2018 as well. And Sam, what are you thinking of Ollie and what he can do with this uh, Odyssey? I think this driver pairing is probably the least experienced one out there in Extreme right now. But GZ, to be fair to her, I think she did a really solid job in her first lap. And you could see that she was super pumped after her first attempt. And it's so refreshing to see somebody going out there and just enjoying the experience. It was really nice. I think Oli, Oli's come into this and he's again going to be learning and improving all the time. And let's see what he does in this second lap. Yeah, just see the cat sand kicking up from where they've gone down this long 100 meter slope and then they'll go crossing where Sarazan crashed this morning and rolled that car. You can still uh, see all of the highlights a little bit later on or on the Extreme E website. And there's a good showing from Oliver Bennett, just trying to get a bit of consistency, get his lap time up slowly, incrementally. They've not got a lot of time on the course at all, Sam, so it's important every time they go out, they're not only driving to their best, but also learning. Learning and improving all the time. Learn from your mistakes from the first lap, improve it on the second lap. Yeah, absolutely, and it's just coming down. It tells you on screen, Rock Hazard will be in about one kilometre. And they're counting down to that really nicely on-screen graphics. That's the section of track that I'm sure Kyle LeDuc took that left high line. I wonder if that was uh, something risky they were trying to see whether or not they'd be able to slot through and just take a shortcut in. I don't think the rock hazard would, uh, would necessarily be the one that they're showing on here. Uh, it would be earlier than this that he'd gone off yesterday. Still looking forward to seeing Kyle LeDuc and Sarah Price. Remember, they haven't had a clean run. They're coming through last. 
and, and it really it, it really is a fight for those top six positions. It really is. Somebody is going to be disappointed that tomorrow that they're, they're still going to get to race for seventh. But Sam, you don't want to race for seventh, do you? Yeah, you make sixth place, you can still win this event. The way today has gone. I'm calling it now. I reckon there's still a twist in the tail on who comes who comes sixth because right now Jensen's got the penalty and it's looking like if these two next cars have a clean run, they should be in front. Having said that, as today goes, who who knows what's going to happen? Yeah, this is extreme, and we are learning very quickly along with you that uh, nothing is quite as it seems. The shifting sands and the shifting time scales as well, penalties, rolls. We've had all sorts of things today, but uh, this is a nice drive from Oliver Bennett. Pretty clean as he heads towards the hill. Now, this is where the sand pits formed, where they can really dig down. So, Sam, which side of the gate would you stick the car on if you're going up here? Oh, don't ask me, Jenny. Come I'm on. not driving Gut today. I, I wish I was, but... <laughs> Um, I'm going to go with left. <laughs> thanks, Sam. That's all right. That Thank, thanks just, for the insight. Well, let's yeah. see what he does it's just here. just a guess. Have a look. Straight through the middle. Yeah, yeah, it was on the left, the left side. Actually. That was to the left. I'll yeah, there that. we go. Thank well you. done, Sam. It was, it was handsome, wasn't it? Who threw the dirt up over the front screen. And again, that's a sign of how committed you are into the dip. Now, whether it's a good or a bad thing is arguable. You know, how much dirt comes up, it's how much you're willing to to risk the car. Now look at the ground. These cars have the most incredible ground clearance, but the ruts now are so deep that you're seeing that the bottom of the car is almost touching them in that section where we saw Claudia Hultgren have uh, the, the big crash this morning in Q1. So certain parts of this track, a couple of the drivers have said now it's getting pretty rough out there. Yeah, we've still got, as I say, a couple of races to come tomorrow. Semi-finals, everybody's going to do a, a semi-final, if you like, a three-car race, and then we're going to head through to the final. So those th three cars that make the final, they're going to have the toughest conditions of all. Absolutely. I'm just looking at these gates in particular. These gates, as they're coming up to the switch zone, you can't go three through those. You're going to have to be very sensible about how you approach this section. There's going to be clear chances to overtake, maybe. <laughs> there are going to be very clear sections where you cannot overtake. I think by the time you reach the point where you go onto and off the road, the race will be over. You know, even if it's close, I just don't think there's anywhere to pass between the two left. So effectively, your last chance is on that run up to it. Well, you've commentated on Timmy Hansen and Christopherson before. I think that you think the race will go. finish at the finish line with those guys. <laughs> we'll see, won't we? They certainly won't give up until that point, Absolutely. will they? Absolutely. Time for the switch. So, Ollie Bennett will come out of the car, and Christine Jean Paolo Zonka will get into the car. Explain about the bungee cord. So, bungee cords on this car are to hold the belts up. Sam, you use a different system in your endurance racing. We used to use bungees. We moved to a magnetic uh, strip on the top of the roll bars inside the car. Um, we found that that was slightly better. We saw a, a fairly timid approach to the pit lane there. Very, very safe on pit entry, and I think that's the right approach. They know that if they just do a clean lap, they should be ahead of Jensen Button's team. It's keeping away from those penalties, and we have seen the penalty for speeding in the pit lane, not getting that limiter on at the right time, is huge. So there's no point taking a risk. They've watched the others go out. They know how costly it's been for their... I suppose a, a good rival for them would be the kind of Arlen Kotlinski and Button pairing. So they don't want to get trapped into that mistake. So you can see Ollie just limbering himself up from his drive, taking it very gingerly towards those two signs which is when they can put their foot down, and away she goes. Good job from Christine in the switch. I'm keen to see whether or not she uses hyperdrive at that point. Now we're going to head down and catch up with someone down in the paddock. Looked like a nice clean drive. How would you describe it? Yeah, I loved it. That was my best session of the weekend. Slowly building the pace. Didn't want to risk it too much because we knew a few of the teams before had some penalties with the speed entry here. So. Just tried to dial it in, make no mistakes in this section like we did earlier. And yeah, if Christine brings it home now, we should be in a good position. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christine doing a great job here. She was uh, impressive in the first run for you, Sam. I think she did a really good job, and she looked delighted by it. You could see the energy she pumped. She wants to do well, um, but she understands as well that she is on the back foot compared to some of the other people. She doesn't have the experience, but solid effort so far. We were looking at sectors, weren't we? And some of the teams have got extreme... The, the, the main sector you can look at on the timing screen that we, we've got, I think there are three, and of course, the, the first and the last one go into and out of the switch zone or off the start. So we really can't judge much from that. But you were looking at the, the middle sector, Sam, and comparing 
teammates, and actually some of them are really close together. Absolutely. Um, was it you Taylor and Christopherson? I think Taylor and Christopherson were, were very close, actually, so she'd done a really, really strong job there. Um, and, and GZ, she'd done a, a very strong job compared to Ollie Bennett as well, so hats off to her. Um, this is now about this team just getting through. Just do no mistakes, make sure there's no issues, don't get caught out by the circuit, and she'll do it. Big jump down the hill now, so fighting for an all-important top six place. Got to go full send on this second half of the lap and see if they can get the job done. Jenny, don't forget, they know about that massive penalty that's been given to uh, Button Squad for the for the speeding. There was a penalty as well for Christopherson and Taylor, but that's actually only dropped them down into P3. So at the minute, it's X44, Acciona and Rosberg are the top three on a cumulative time from Q1 and Q2. This is now about who's going to scrape into the top six. And with Button's penalty, these guys have got their eyes on that prize. Absolutely. They cannot rest on their laurels. They've got to make sure they push, 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 because that battle to get into tomorrow is all important. You don't don't get into that top six you don't get a chance to win the race it is as simple as that you will battle it out yes for seventh eighth ninth championship points but what you really want to do is get in there and get a chance to win if you're battling for seventh eighth ninth they're going to be your only championship points if you make it through to the semi-finals yeah you could be looking at a big haul if you can make it through to the final in particular so yeah you'd fancy your chances in the three car race anyway sam you know if it's if you're up it's, even if there's only one slot going through with some of the drama we've seen if you can win the start i think you can make it really Really difficult for everybody else anyway exactly regardless of the pace differential between some of these people you get to turn one first you could be in for a big haul of points also there's been some some big offs and if you just keep it on the road you again you could be in for some big points I can't see this car winning on pace and pace alone but if you can make the top six you never know around the left hander down the far end of the circuit About to cross the road here, so flicks the car a little bit left. We've seen a little bit of sideways, around 100 kilometers an hour now, going across the road section here. It's a little hop up onto it. Funny hop just for Easter. That's nice, isn't it, for them to give us a little bit of loving from that. And they're just then the dash along, and they'll do the hard left, pushing out the rear end, kicking up that sand, which is pulled now in those big voids caused by the cars going along there so fast and really digging in. Look, they can see that gap is just coming down and down. Can they manage to make it? Penalties still to be added on to this. Just a reminder. But this is a battle now for Christine GZ. She's going to have to push it really hard through to the end and she'll come down. She's got a on board of her, but she'll come down this hill where it's rutted so much at the bottom. Oh, she a lot of lock there, ball. Jenny. Huge amount of lock. She had the wheel wound all the way around to the lock stops. Held on to it nicely, though. That's where we were talking earlier on about crucially knowing exactly what angle the wheel is at. See how big the ruts are here now? Yeah, they are groovy time, for sure. Much, much deeper than they were before. If you get the bottom of the car in contact with it, that takes out all that suspension travel. You can see absolutely huge travel for the Continental tyres to head right up into those wheel arches. Tidy run. At the moment, Arlen Koklinski and Button are not showing with their penalty, are they, on the on the timing screen? So uh, once the penalty is added to that, it's going to drop them down further, and uh, we'll have some much cleverer people than us in the background uh, working out spreadsheets and oh, getting I'll give things it a ready. Go. I'll give well, it a Jenny's go. got the pen out. She's got the pen out. <laughs> and the highlighters. Uh, we'll have a crack at it. So they're coming around now. It's going to be uh, P6 for them on the road but I'm pretty confident they're going to be... I'm trying to remember what the penalty was. So, yeah, 12 minutes, 175, okay. almost three <laughs> yeah, minutes. Then, I yeah, think they're, they're, they're going to be OK. So they're, they're P5. Fine. They made it easy for us, making it almost three minutes. Um, the penalty accrued through the uh, driving through the switch zone too fast and then for leaving the switch zone ahead of that 45-second minimum limit. That's also, I'm looking at that, of course, that's such a huge penalty with it being the addition of the two times. That's really handed an opportunity to chip Ganassi Racing. So those guys had the problem this morning, remember, and they lost a fair bit of time, but they were actually only 1 minute 11 seconds behind Jensen Button's squad this morning. Now, if Button's had a three-minute penalty, it could be that both Hispano Suiza XI Energy and Segi TV Chip Ganassi Racing go ahead of them. But this is a car that's had problems all weekend so far. They've got to have a clean run. They haven't had that yet. They've had power steering issues, which really plagued them in Quali 1. 
if they've got it oh. sorted. And no way, Sam. So we're hearing potentially it's not going to run, just as Sam was explaining. Bang on the money. They've had those issues. Yesterday, Carl Leduc had an off into the rock face, ripped the front left corner, front right corner off the car. They fixed it, but both drivers suffered a power steering Fanny Jenny, just as we were saying, this could, this could be their chance for handed an opportunity because of the button penalty. Oh, it's cruel. Arlen Kotlinski speeding in the pit lane. Actually, it looks like they're not going to make it. Cruel fate that they've suffered here once again for the Chip Ganassi racing team. And we have heard from Chip Ganassi himself standing there in the command center. And look, they're trying to get it to work. It's such a small crew. They, uh, agreed, absolutely agreed. So they're on it. These guys are on it. They're desperately trying to fix the car. We'd love to try and find out what's going on down there. So this uh, Ollie Bennett heading off the line first. Last time out, he went second driver. This time round, he goes first. That's the rules for qualifying. You have to switch your order. It's going to be fascinating tomorrow to see what order they put the drivers in, in because it's going to come down to tactics tomorrow. Who do you think can win the battle on the run to turn one? Who do you think is your best racer? Or do you know what? Do you just follow them in the dust and send your best racer out in the second one and see if you can find a pass? Jenny, we really don't know, and neither do they. There's also this contact factor of who do you want to put out there first? There's someone that is used to contact, who can be aggressive off that start and really hustle everybody else. Uh, certainly, it's going to be a fascinating watch to see what happens. Here we go. Switch zone for Hispano Suiza as they take Ollie out and put Christine back into the car. Seemed to be pretty uh, seamless for them there, and uh, certainly Christine showing how adept she's come so quickly with this circuit, feeling quite at home with it. She's comfortable and she looks it in the car. So a really good showing from the number 42 car um, around this Saudi track. 8.8 .8 kilometers, really starting to groove up and cut up as they go round it. And that will prove an additional problem for tomorrow. Looks very relaxed behind the wheel. Another good performance. And it might be enough to see them in the top six. As we say, we're seeing potential problems for the last car to run. Are they going to make it through? Crossing the line a little way off the pace, but thanks to problems for others, they might make that top six. Well, amazing session so far. I think uh, we uh, Chip Ganassi racing, then it sounds like are not going to take the start. So that gives a lot of opportunities tomorrow to the different teams, because obviously we've had Veloce not able to run today, and we've had the other car of Cupra. So these are the results. You've got Loeb and Gutierrez in first place, followed by the Sands and Sainz car in second. Christopherson and Taylor picking up that penalty, shuffling down to third. Then it's Hansen Mullings into fourth, fifth for Bennett and Giampaola Zonka, sixth for Button and Arlen Kotolinski, even though they've got the got that penalty they get let out of jail because it was Leduc and Price who aren't able to run in this Ekstrom and Hurtgen managing unfortunately to tumble the car in the first session and Sarazan also so they didn't even get out so a disappointing end to the day to those three teams but you have to look at the quality of this field I'll tell you what that'll be a hell of a race tomorrow if they get those cars fixed to see Sarazan Chadwick Hurtgen Ekstrom Leduc and Price go up against it they're going to be looking desperately to, to try and salvage just a few points. And I think the other thing that's exciting for us, I'm disappointed not to see or any of the cars go through, but those three in particular, are, I think will be quick later on in the season. And so it will be redemption time. And we're not really going to know how fast they are, Jenny, until we get to Lac Rose, Dakar and Senegal. So could be could be fun later on in the year. We just need to explain the black numbers, one, two and three. Denote the top three cars that go through to the first race. Going through to the crazy race, four, five and six. Six. Two of those cars will get a chance. No, one of those cars will get a chance to go through to the final and then the final race as well for seventh, eighth and ninth. Now, we spoke about this earlier on and Hanson and Munnings and whether they'd want to be P3 or P4. They ended up P4 with the greatest respect to the competitors in their crazy race. I think that they have the form to take that. But Button and Arlen Kotlinski were really improving on their second run today. And that run to the first corner if any of those cars can win it, well, all to play for. I'm joined by Formula One ace David Coulthard. David, tell me about your experience of Alula. It's just been incredible. I'm sure everyone's been waxing lyrical about uh, how spectacular the scenery is. Um, I've had the privilege to come to Saudi, Saudi Arabia several times since 96, so I've seen the development of the country as well. And, you know, I think this is a really big statement of uh, where, what we can expect in the future. 
I've seen you buzzing around the command centre, the paddock as well. Are there any particular teams that stand out for you? Well, what's been really interesting, as we see, you know, it's clearly a testing conditions, but the, the, the you know, the old former duel between the Rosberg team and X44 Hamilton's team seems to be pretty hot. Uh, Sebastian Loeb, of course, uh, incredible driver out there. Um, there's been some issues for some of the other teams and we've lost two cars already, but that's all part of this extreme adventure. It looks beautiful, but it's also an unforgiving landscape. Does, do you fancy getting out there in the car? Well, I had the opportunity to go around uh, with Timo Schneider and that was just incredible. And it, it was such a rush, like adrenaline off the scale. So it takes you to another level. And the more I'm getting wrapped up in this whole journey, the more I'm wishing I had an involvement beyond just, you know, being an enthusiastic spectator. I can imagine it makes you want to get back in the car. Thank you so much. Thank you. Look at that, absolutely stunning. First day ever of qualifying for Extreme E. We really didn't know what to expect. I, I know you guys didn't know either. Do you know what? I don't think the teams knew. And, and Q1 this morning was an absolute roller coaster. Q2, a little bit calmer, Jenny. And I just wonder if, if they went into it, and particularly with a couple of cars that had issues, you were able to play it a little bit safer. I think it needed to be, to be honest. There was still some exemplary driving. There were still people pushing to the limit. But I think after the risks that were taken and the, the punishments that were dealt out in the first session, they had to be a little bit more conservative. Let's hear from Sebastian Loeb, who will be talking to us from the X44 car. Well, congratulations, absolute leaders of the qualifiers. How are you feeling? Uh, for sure, we, we feel okay, we feel happy. Uh, we didn't really know what to expect before we, we started the day. We saw uh, a few mistakes from different drivers, a few problems for different teams. And uh, for us, everything went well. So I think we had a, a good rhythm in the fir first loop in the morning, pushing hard, uh, trying our best. Second loop, uh, we just wanted to secure. Finally, uh, our main rivals uh, made a little mistake and in the driver change. So we won the qualifying. That's, uh, that's great. It's uh, better than we, we could expect. So I'm really happy at the moment. You both were arguably the most consistent team on the course. Was that part of the plan? Yes, it's the part of the plan because uh, I think it's important to be smart in the in the track, especially the second loop because it's totally destroyed compared with this morning. So I think we need to be happy uh, and I hope tomorrow more and more things. Tomorrow it will change slightly. You'll both be racing against your other competitors. How much will that change for yeah, you? Yeah, for sure it will be very different. Uh, I don't know exactly what will be, how it will work tomorrow. I think if we race all together, it will be really tough in this kind of condition. Uh, I think if we, you, are, you are behind, it will be impossible to, to follow because of the dust. So we don't know. Uh, in this case, we need to take a good start and uh, it's what we will try to do. So, but uh, looking forward to, to drive tomorrow. It will be even more challenging in the stage, I think, because it starts to be more rough because of the, all the, the passes of the car. So it will be hard, uh, hard work in the car tomorrow. Christina Seb describes it as more challenging. Going head to head for you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's totally new for me. So I, for me, it's so 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 exciting, and I, I think we need to to do test me because I never did again, and so I'm happy to that. Well, we look forward to seeing you <laughs> yeah, both run that course. tomorrow. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. So those are two leading drivers with Loeb and Gutierrez just chatting there to Layla and Ali in the paddock. So let's take you back to what happened this morning and some of those biggest incidents, because it was a cracker of a session. It absolutely was. So this was Katie Munnings, who was the, the first person to... Well, th this, this was the, the puncture on the rear right. Look at the sand it was flicking up. She came through the hairpin at the end of the course, and we were like, wow, that looks dusty. It's going to be hard to pass there. And then, Sam, we realised that she was carrying this rear right puncture, and it really was a brilliant job. Can't We can't understate that, can we, for her to get the car back? Well, what we didn't realise is that she was suffering this the whole lap. So absolute credit to her for giving it absolutely everything. You thought that she was nursing the car. No, she wasn't. She, she was wasn't pushing. there, was she? She was pushing.
Yeah, great job. So Katie managed to get the car back. And, you know, at the time they were ever so disappointed. But in fact, because there were other incidents in the session, which I think we're probably about to see, you'll see that really a puncture was pretty low on the list of, of woes for the teams out in Saudi Arabia. Um, it, that was a minor one. Now, that you know, they sat in P4 and P4 is where they have ended up. But as I said, tomorrow, when they look at that crazy race lineup, I'm pretty certain they'll put Hansen in the car first of all. Uh, but he'll be going up against Bennett and I think Jensen Button because those guys have all got experience, Jenny, of what you said, which is racing to the first corner. Yeah, it'd be fascinating to see what they do pick and how they decide to do the tactics of this race. It's not just a simple, you know, get in the car and drive. They've got to think about this and they've got to think about their own individual situation. Now, this is the Veloce car, Stefan Sarazan, a great all-rounder, but as you can see, comes down the big drop-off, goes okay at the moment, and then he gets to the road where the bumps are and he just loses it, and you'll see what happens, but it's, um, it's a mighty one, isn't it? He's so unlucky because the car steps left and if you look at when it lands, he nearly gets it right. And if we see the onboard, watch his hands position on the wheel because even after, and we might see it in a minute, even after he's had the shunt, he's facing the wheels in the right direction because the trajectory of the car is good. So watch down here, he crosses the road, exactly what Jenny said, just loses the rear by half a foot. Going to be just below our vision here. Okay. So watch the onboard here. Sam, you might be able to talk us through as well in terms of the wheel. We might see the sideways one of it. And you see him pointing as if I can save it, I can save it. And then, of course, he braces because he knows he can't. Yeah, we've seen a couple of times with this Odyssey car, this Extreme E car, when the rear digs in, it then sends you the other way. And that sent him over a little bit. The rear of the car has a slightly stiffer suspension than the front for obvious reasons because of the battery. The steering hand is turning into the slide and over he goes. He, yeah, you know what I mean about hitting that tuft on the right. He yeah. got the wheels in, this will land, this will land. But when it landed, it dug in. Yeah. When weight came back the other way well, and it was I a big one. That's what I mean about the heavy yeah. rear end and the stiffer suspension. As we now see the other big crash of the day, this one really dug in. Yeah, Claudia Hurtgen. Wow. I mean, uh, wow. It was just great to see her get out. Yeah, it was. It it really was. The was. team said, didn't they, best pictures of the day. There was a big relief because Claudia's radio wasn't working. And I think because of that, everyone was concerned as to whether she was OK. She was shaken, but she was perfectly OK. And that, as I say, that's a credit to Spark and, uh, you know, the, the build of the cars. And we said, didn't we, at the time, that it was such a small mistake that gave such a big punishment for Apt Cooper. So really unlucky for them. Uh, and unfortunately for them, ruled them out but this is all about a bigger picture it's about the environment and this is professor richard washington to tell us more a lot of people think that extremely is just a, another race series it's so much more than that i'm professor peter wadhams of cambridge university and i'm chairman of the science committee for extreme e one of the race locations for the Extreme E is the Arctic, and I've spent most of my career working in the Arctic. The changes I've seen have just been enormous. Here I am standing on top of the Greenland ice sheet. If all of the ice on the Greenland ice sheet melted, most of the Earth's coastal cities would be flooded. It's a very serious situation. Ice caps melting in Greenland actually is impacting the coastlines of Africa thousands of miles away. The ocean is connected. It's not like our land masses. When we talk about the ocean, it is just one entity. And that's pretty amazing. We're all connected. So as well as sea level rise and other consequences of climate change, coastlines across the globe have relatively new impacts like plastic pollution. And a recent study in the Atlantic estimated that across the globe we have about 21 million tonnes of these tiny plastic particles floating out there in the ocean. It is really a challenge that is global. We hear a lot about ice melt and sea level rise and changes to the rainforests. We hear very little about the dead. So our scientific panel there, and we are up and running in Saudi Arabia, and our desert location is the first of five very different landscapes to showcase season one of Extreme E. And it may well be the driest, but um, our next location will be 
at least have a little bit of a sea breeze. It's along the coast of West Africa on Senegal's Cap Vert Peninsula, where half the coral and a third of the mangroves have been lost and plastic pollution is destroying the ocean environment. Then we go to the Arctic and an old US airfield in Greenland. And then we head from there to the Amazon and Brazil, a population 213 million and the rainforest, the plight that is being suffered there with deforestation threatening us all. And finally, we sail onto the tip of South America to Tierra del Fuego in Argentina, where the Glacier X Prix will showcase the disappearing glaciers, thinning ice and receding snow lines. We are in for one heck of a world tour to come. Well, what a first day for Extreme E. Two qualifying sessions, absolute drama this morning. Thank you very much, Samba, for joining us. Very quickly, your thoughts? I've thoroughly enjoyed it. What an amazing first day. What a great journey this has been. Um, I'm, I'm really, really excited to see what Extreme E has to offer. I think we all are. It's been an absolute delight, Sam, to have you in the box. Andrew Coley and myself, just make sure whatever you do, come back tomorrow because we have had a treat of a day and we haven't even started racing yet. So tomorrow, let's see what happens. Loeb and Gutierrez will be in pole position for this one. A battle royale in Saudi Arabia. Come back then. From all of us here, goodbye.